on in, come on in. Hello. everyone how you doing this is Wanda your host of salty coffee podcast woo woo it is Tuesday and it's brick cold in New York how's everybody doing I hope you're doing okay I have some good news but let me tell you a little bit something about the podcast so this podcast was created to empower inspire entertain and inform in many different categories and topics like parenting relationships finances education workforce but tonight we're going to talk a little bit about filming and a good friend of mine who will share his experiences on filming for almost 25 years. That's a long time. So I'm 51. I'll be 52 soon. Wow. Shit. 52. <laughs> but I was born in Brooklyn, raised in Washington Heights, and now I live in the Bronx. And just so you are aware, yes, I'm very close to the fire that occurred on January uh, 9th, on 181st by Webster Avenue. And, you know, it's, it's uh, kind of sad, but if you know of, if you want to learn where you can donate or where you can contribute or where you can find a place to give money, the Bronx, Bronx Borough President, Vanessa Gibson. She is recently elected for the Bronx Borough President, along with Felix Oswald Feliz, who's the city district council person for our district. He actually was on the Salty Coffee podcast and was elected this for this term also. So here's the information for those of you who are listening through a podcast. Please go to www.saltycoffeepodcast.com for more information for the flyer. But for those of you who are on YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, and Twitter, um, the information is here on this flyer. You can always come back and visit and replay. So I also have good news. We are now in the Netherlands from North Holland. So, welcome, North Holland. Hallelujah. <laughs> I don't know what to think when, when people say Holland, like North Holland. What, the Netherlands. Okay. Well, I'm glad you're here. So, Argentina. Let's give a shout out to Argentina. Ecuador, Ireland, Canada, Italy, Puerto Rico. Finland, the UK, Australia. And now the Netherlands. I mean, how, how could, let's say, Finland and the Netherlands win Mississippi? How is Mississippi not on my list of listeners? I don't get that. But that's okay. So kudos. And from the USA, we have New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Georgia, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, California, Texas, Florida, Michigan, Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, Illinois, and Arkansas. And we still don't have Mississippi. And speaking of Mississippi, my lady Shelby, she has a new release. There's one thing that I want you to know, you to know. Before I let you go, I let you go. There's nothing that we can work out. Work out. Because God is in control. God is in control. If you're not Let me know. Mm -hmm. Please just tell me. 
That lady is amazing. And I told her that just tell me sounds like a theme song for the next film. Right? What do you think? She's amazing. She's from Mississippi, Bosberg. And you can watch our interview. I went all the way to Mississippi to visit her and get to know her in person. Isn't that awesome? Well, we love um, uh, some Shelby. But tonight, we have Mark Cabroy. I met Mark, what, maybe 20-something years ago? Oh, Mark. You know, us coworkers, we talk a lot of, you know, crap over the phone. And then you don't really know what they do outside of work. And then you're like, oh, shit, this motherfucker is a film writer, the producer, director. Award-winning of short films, commercials, music videos, and educational films. He attended the School of Arts. And he freelanced, which this I did not know. He freelanced as a writer for children's television workshop, which includes Sesame Street and Electric Company. But he's written and directed and produced over 20 short films, commercials, and music videos. I did not know this about Mark. But here we go. Let's, let's meet Mark. Mark. Hold on, Mark. How are you? Hold on. How are you? Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Oh, hold on. There I am. <laughs> How are you? What's good. going on? Good, good. It's are you good. happy? I not am. to be at work. <laughs> I, I, I am, and it's funny. You're right. We did meet uh, 20 years ago. You were probably what 30, and I wasn't born yet. So, <laughs> so that makes me no. I okay, <clears throat> I was 10. So, I was 10, and you were 30. So. I don't think I was there for 10 years. You remember? I've been there for 31 years. Yeah, it was 2000, I think. So maybe more. But you just made 10 years, I think. Yeah. Okay. So did I. Well, I, I. I started late there. I didn't start. Early. Okay. Welcome Thank you. to the Salty Coffee Podcast. Thank, Thank you, you for, for saying me. yes. Thank you for having me on. And hopefully your our colleagues will be like, oh my God, look at these two. <laughs> oh my God. Can I take your order? <laughs> okay. So just. I, you know, there were some things as I was doing my research that I did not know about you in the film industry part. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's amazing how you have friends and you have coworkers that you support. And you were very, like, focused. And I don't know on what, but you were very focused on your stuff. And, and I'm very proud of you. I'm very Thank proud you. that, you know, you did your thing. Even though you did, uh, you know, what you would call a traditional nine to five, right? Mm -hmm. But tell us a little bit about your, where you grew up, where you were born. I mean, you don't have to go into details. You sure. can make it into a film later on, but. I, actually, little... I actually wrote a script about it. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I, I, was, I was born in, in Queens in, in Corona. Um, I grew up mostly in Flushing. Um, first uh, in no, Flushing's a weird community in Queens. So, and then I, I went to college. Why do you say Queens. that? Well, it's very, it was when I grew up there in the 70s, it was very eclectic. But the thing about it is, is that there was definitely like um, a segregated kind of, it was integrated, but it was very, seg I grew up in a very segregated kind of neighborhood. So it was mostly, you know, working class, people of color, you know. Uh, if there were Caucasian or white people there, they had more, moved out. When I, the part of Flushing I moved into, uh, when you got on the bus and went into like what they call Main Street Flushing, where all the department stores were like Gertz and Woolworths and the, the movie theaters, that's when you really saw quote unquote white society. That's when you saw white people. Daddy. But when you went back to the, the suburbs where I lived, it was all these people of color, Hispanic, black, you know. It was very ethnic back there. So it was definitely a segregated line that you felt. I don't really feel racism per se, but I, it was like it was like a it was like a paradigm shift. It's like crossing night to day. You went, okay, I'm going here and now I'm moving to where these other folks are. So but it was good. I, I loved Queens. I, I loved Queens. I love flushing. It was I have a lot of great memories uh, of it. It's funny because the place I lived, and I, I don't want to go off too off track. 
uh, it was the last block that they must have been building in that area because it just terminated, the street terminated into this giant lot, like wood, it looked like Central Park. It must have been about a mile wide, about a half a mile deep. They just stopped building. They stopped paving, they stopped everything. And it's, it just ended like out of a movie set. And it sounds so, like the the Sheridan Highway isn't that isn't it the Sheridan Highway where they just cut it off from where it just ends? Just ends. <laughs> and wow. So what, what happened was, you know, I was the third house from this termination point, and we didn't own. That was the other thing. My parents were uh, not what you call high earners. <laughs> okay. My father I mean, would send them to be chronically unemployed, and so everybody owned their house, but we rented from this West Indian guy who had a, like a second house. And so we were the only renters in the block. Everybody else owned, everybody else had a car, everybody else had everything. And we had just come from uh, a fire, the house had burned down, so we lost everything. Wow. And so we were really kind of starting over. And I was the youngest of four kids, so I was like five and eight, my oldest sister was like 13. So it was a big gap between us. Uh, but I remember fondly uh, going into that woods in the summer and the winter, that was like my playground. and. My first films were actually made in that woods, you know, um, even though it was kind of. Is it still the woods? Like, what is it called? No, no, I went back there like 10 or 20 years ago. Okay. Uh, and they had obviously, the city had then developed it and continued paving and they built more houses and they developed it. But it was okay. like, I guess at the time, back in the 60s and I guess, um, I guess early 70s up to that point, they just didn't push. They stopped, and so it was a very, it's very surreal. I wish I had, I wish, I often wish that we, I had, even though I was a photographer, I wish I had taken more pictures that survived that day, because it was so right. surreal, and I have these very vivid memories of, of, uh, of the place. But to me, I thought it was just the, the, the greatest place ever. Do you still, do you think you could still replicate the vision through your art and what you do in film? I you imagine so if I really wanted to. I mean, it wasn't so much the, the look of the place as what it represented. You yeah. know, when I first started making films, it wasn't, I didn't really have a lot of friends. And so it wasn't generally accepted to, you know, make films. There was no Spike Lee. There was no, there was none of that. So, you know, you had a couple like Ossie Davis, you had Melvin Van Peebles. These were the people who, you know, you had, there were really no black directors or filmmakers. And my dad, who loved me very much, told me, listen, it's, it's not really for you. You know, there's no black directors. It's not gonna, the few that are out there, they, they grind down. So you might want to really rethink your choices. He wanted me to be something practical, like a computer analyst or something like that. Or, and really? Like, around that time? Because oh, yeah. you're kind of old. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I know. Trust me. Yeah, around that time. In the 60s, there was really, I mean, there were black directors, but it's not commonplace. So now. the computers back then had like that phone. You're talking about like with the phone? Because they... Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna shock you. There were no computers back then. Remember, was the no? I remember. 70s? So so you mean electronics, as in like there was there was no electronics. It was all analog. It was all film oh, okay. and cameras. So and, he wanted you to be what? Well, it, it was key punch stuff that back then. You know, they they maybe they key punched it and you fed it in like Fortran. You, like data you, entry type of thing. Yeah, but you know, you 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 wrote programs, but you wrote them on these cards and you fed them into you know, oh. Okay. And, and computers were very basic back then. And I think because okay. Arthur Ashe had that kind of life. He was this officer in the military. Mm -hmm. He played tennis. He was a famous tennis player, but yet he had a practical job. And I think he wanted, to him, that seemed like the, like the, the epitome of, of, of success, you know, the freedom to not have to, you know, bust my ass like he was killing himself with his jobs. Right. And to be able to do something that was kind of esoteric, like play tennis, you know, and do something sporty. And so that seemed cool to him. And uh, that wasn't my dream. That was his. So I remember when I met you over the phone, I didn't think you were what you look like. So what do you, I'm what not, do you do? I'm, I'm not what I look like. I know you're not. <laughs> so what, what do people think? Like, do you get that question a lot? Well, what are you, Mark? And you're like, I'm a film. Maker, well, I'm a director. What, the, what, well, what do you mean? I, what am I? In school, because I, you know, I'm fair skinned, and my my parents were from my parents' parents are from the island. So my father's okay. father's from Cuba, and my mother's mother and father were from Saint Troy and Saint Kitts, those kind of places. Okay. Um, people would ask me what race am I, and I would always say I'm 
human race. <laughs> Why do you, you think know? you said that? Because uh, you hated because the question? I just didn't understand where it was coming from. To me, I grew up in a black neighborhood. I just identified as being black. You know, there's all shades of black, just like there's all shades of Hispanic and Latinas. And so people tend to look at Dominicans who are dark skin think they're black people. And right. they think of Hispanic people as as uh, Natalie Wood in West Side Story. And she's not even Hispanic, but you know, olive skin, straight hair, white Caucasian light, but just with a slight tinge to it. Uh, and you know, with a sassy uh, accent. And, and you, you tend to like that stuff a lot. <laughs> like what? The sassy, like you, you like the characters in some of your films, right? I do, I do write yeah. characters who are sassy. I think, um, you know, I have this kind of skewered uh, vision of things. You know, it's funny. You know, I I've done dramas, um, but I prefer to do comedies only because, you know, if you do a drama and you go to a theater to see your film, and I've been in theaters with, where, you know. You've been to one or two screens where sometimes only a few people in screening, sometimes there's hundreds of people in screening. You do a drama and maybe you get a reaction from people because you know people go, oh. But when you do a comedy, you know, you know it's <laughs> it's too well. I do. So you hold you hold your breath until that first laugh comes in. And then that yeah. first laugh is like, Oh, thank God, they got it, you know. So it's it, it was more of an immediate reaction for me. Drama is you're like, Yeah, do they get it? Do they not get it? And everybody always after these screens always come to you and say things like, I really liked your film and well, your film changed my life. I'm like, really? Okay. Well, that's what I was going for. Well, that's good to hear. I was going to ask you because after doing a lot of intensive research on you oh, after I mean, the match, let, like let me, let me, let me tell you something that uh, an indictment is not, uh, <laughs> it is not, it is not, it is I'm not just a, a notary. <laughs> it just it just means that they're investigating me. I'm a person of interest. It doesn't mean any of it. No, um, I did not know that last part that I mentioned when I said your bio about you writing for the oh, so, so the workshop. Yeah, that was a strange the children's thing. television workshop. Yeah, that was a strange thing that came up. Um, <clears throat> after college, I was kind of trying to write. You know, you try and write scripts and uh you know i didn't really have an agent i just you know i, I my parents had, i moved back home and they said listen don't work just write and get yourself together and don't worry about it you know we'll support you we won't give you any money but you don't okay. have to pay any bills and you can just stay at home and write and stuff and you can work your odd jobs to okay. get some money in your pocket and so i was kind of writing and, and trying to do stuff and, and you know and it was the early 80s and so that was the time when everybody was making money in the stock market so i was broke all the time all my friends had started jobs they they were going out i was always broke always broke you know i mean because i make i make these little videos and stuff i get paid a couple dollars for it and the money be gone like that and a friend of mine was um vacationing on martha's vineyard and uh he came back to him hey, you, you had a friend i had one friend on that's all i had one friend <laughs> And he came back to hey, I, was, I met some people. Uh, I met this guy in Martha's Vineyard. He was vacationing. And he, he's a he's a producer for uh, Sesame Street. I'm like, oh, that's great. And he's looking for a writer. And I told him about you. I'm like, well, yeah, I me. That's great. And to be honest with you, you know, you get these a lot. People say, oh, I know this guy. I know this woman. And they do. It. It's always like pillow talk because well, people talk. You know, they talk trash. Then when you go and ask them for something, like, oh, I didn't mean that. I meant you know this. So I called the guy up and he said, yeah. And then you had to pay $500 to get in. <laughs> exactly. So his name was T. Collins. He's a very nice guy. Um, he told me a little bit. He was one of the original people who started Sesame Street, one of the original artists that they had hired back in the 60s. Okay. And he was like in his 70s or something like that. But he was still doing cartoons. He he wrote, he was the one who created and wrote Wonder the Witch. Get out. Yes. He wrote what are you Wonder trying to say? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just kidding. Saying, so that was like a big cartoon in Sesame Street at the time. So he said, listen, I have a writer that I used to work with and she's getting stale. She doesn't want to do it. She wants to Wait, there was a Wanda the Witch in Sesame Street? I yeah, must be Google. very young. Yeah, yeah, I don't remember Wanda, that. Wanda the Witch was like a regular cartoon in Sesame really? Street. Really? A yeah. puppet? No, it was like a cartoon. Oh, Wanda a cartoon. Okay. Because yeah, they were always coming up with characters that were like, Why did they know, take it off? They, they, they rotated it. It's just stuff that oh, they okay. did. And, you know, they were constantly filtering in new stuff. Remember, this is stuff that he drew 
in the 60s and now they're okay. always updating it so anyway he asked me he said would you be willing to you know, submit some scripts i said well what do you you know what do you do he said well i'm gonna write cartoons so they give me letters uh, or things and you write like a one page two page script and then i board it and i send it to them they okay. like it they pick it up and then they pay me to do it and i pay you so write 10 things maybe i'll pick six maybe they'll pick three okay <laughs> you know so i said okay so uh, fine okay so 10 10 one page things or two pages okay so i thought wow okay i better write some stuff so they gave me some letters or something i think it was w and q and I don't know bread. I mean, you know weird things. It's for kids. So I'm, I'm writing the script. I write ten page things. I go okay. Like two days later, okay, I got ten pages right. Okay, let's meet. So he lived on like 72nd on the west side, uh, uh, and we meet in this diner and stuff. And he's an older guy, like in the 70s, slightly gray hair, you know, nice guy. We go into the diner, we're having coffee and stuff. So we got I'm doing the pages. So he goes like this. I swear to God. So I'm thinking, what do I charge him for? I never. I didn't write cartoons. What do I charge them? You know, I said, I, you know, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna ask him for a hundred dollars a page, hundred dollars a page because that's good money. You know, I'm gonna hundred dollars <laughs> a page, and I'm gonna be firm on that stuff because I'm. That's how you have to play with these guys. Let them know you mean business. <laughs> I'll wait until you say something and say hundred bucks a page. But first, I'm gonna let them like it first, right? right. So, so he goes. He does one of these numbers. Hmm. Hmm. I'm like this. Look. <laughs> I know you were, because you were in your twenties at this point. Oh, I was like in my twenties. I'm uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and hadn't sold shit writing wise yet, right? <laughs> I was just pounding. Look at my. I was just typing for my own enjoyment. So he's like, "Good." Like, hmm. He said, "Well, these are uh, these are pretty good, Mark." I said, "Well, thank you." He said, um, "Uh." I'll take these, you know, and I'll storyboard them, and I'll submit all ten of them and see what they say. I said, okay, great. So I'm getting to say, hundred bucks a page, right? He said, <laughs> so um, standard fee, okay, four hundred dollars a page. Yes, exactly. Of course, standard. <laughs> of course, standard. what am I, an idiot? Of course, it's standard. Everybody knows four hundred dollars a page is standard. And so that first lesson I learned was keep your mouth shut when you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Because I would have said $100 a page. This guy would have had to keep a poker face. Said, okay. A hundred? You sure page. about that? <laughs> he would have been like, wait, a hundred. Right. Wait, so he what? submitted like, I think about eight of them. I think they picked three or four of them. And he wound up negotiating me down to 275 a page because they cut his budget. But still, it was a lot more than what I would ask for. They so probably did the, my... the research. No, it's just they, oh, okay. they, they give you so much money to do it. You know, okay. he had to remember he had to do everything. He did everything. He wrote, he didn't write it, but he drew it and animated it and did everything. Got it. So uh, he was an old school guy, but it, it was good. So I, I wound up doing a couple more for him. And then he introduced me to his producer who was doing Electric Company. And she had seen some of my work and she said, Would I like to write for Electric Company? And I said, right. Sure. And she said, listen, what we need is we need overseas writers because we're, we're, in, we're in different countries now. So we need people to write electric company in like Beirut. And if you want to direct, you can go to Beirut and direct. I'm like, isn't there like a civil war going on in Beirut? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, damn, damn, I want to direct with you know, I'm not trying to die in my heart. So I turned in a directing thing I just wrote. But I used to have to go to the UN after I wrote a script. And really? The UN, yes. And they would go through my script to make sure I didn't do anything that might be offensive to that country. Like I couldn't make fun of food because people were starving. I couldn't do certain jokes, you know, that I did it. And they would go through it. Well, I guess their ambassador or whatever. And then he would approve it. And then they would give it back to uh, those guys and they would do it. That's so cool. that was an interesting experience. I only did a couple of episodes because the producer I was working for uh, got a promotion. She left. And I didn't have you. Know, you have to have like that that rabbi on the inside because everybody's trying to right. try to write. So I only did a couple of I only did like maybe a dozen or two dozen cartoons, maybe a two or three episodes of Electric Company before my connection left. And then I I couldn't I I did hook up with another guy who she introduced me to, who was doing three two one contact. Okay. And he was developing uh, a show called Square One, and I was trying to get on that show as a director, as a segment director. So I went out and made my own 
spec segment for what I thought would be an episode of Square One because they would do parodies of TV shows. So I did something called The Math Zone about mm-hmm. a little girl, a little three minutes segment, a little girl who, whose, parent, whose mother sends her to the store um, to get something. No, 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 she's failing math. And she makes a wish that she says she wished she never heard of math. That's what it is. And so she throws her math book on the bed and falls asleep. And when she wakes up, she goes in there and says, oh, listen, I want you to go to the store for me and uh, get me three pounds of this and so-and-so this and this. And she says, what? And as the mother keeps mentioning numbers, she doesn't know what they mean because she's never heard of math. And so at the end, it has a rod swirling like in person saying, you know, be careful what you wish for because you you'll find it. You think? <laughs> yeah. And so I shot it and I sent it to them, you know, over at math, square one. And they liked the idea, they said, but they were going to go with a segment called Math Net, like Drag Net, about these two policemen who were investigating in math crimes. Yeah. And so they went with that, and that was my thing. But it was kind of fun to shoot. And, you know, and those big, those things, I was always doing very impulsive things. So, wait, was, I, was that your first film, or that was just your So, no, what, what no, did you no. start first, writing? Oh, or, yeah, I wrote because I didn't have a camera. Uh, you know, I wanted okay. to. Uh, make films, but my parents didn't ha- have a, a film camera. They didn't have a, a movie camera. Uh, they had like a you know one of those big cameras with the flash bulb things, one of those round things where the reporters had. And you put the bulb yeah. in. They had one of those, uh, and they you know you turned it like that, right? And the film went in. Young um, people will not know anything of what you're talking oh, about. Oh, they had this, they had but this that's big, okay. Bra- this big brownie kind of camera. It like the, if you look at those old movies from the 20s, they always the reporters always had these little big cameras. And so I would I walked around from neighbors' doors asking if I could borrow their cameras. And of course, I got a lot of doors slammed in my face. I was like 10 years old. <laughs> can I borrow your camera? Are you talking like the ones that pop out? Like yes, the flash okay. bulbs pop out. There's yeah, a there. I learned something new about that. I, I there's a name for it. And I was like, that's what they call them? Well, they called them they I think what the, what did they call them? I yeah, don't the, remember. The, the strobe on those things, the handles. Mm-hmm. Those are what laser saber handles are in Star Wars. When they were okay. making Star Wars, they just needed laser saber handles. So they took the handles off those. And if you look at the Star Wars, they saw the little clip where the, the power cord goes in. Okay. And they just screwed in a hilt. And that's what Obi-Wan and those guys are using. Get out. Handles. Yeah. Okay. That's a bit of trivia for you from your old Uncle Mark. So you started writing because you didn't have a camera. I didn't have a camera. And, you're, so... and you were 10 years old? Well, no. At this point now, I was 13 or 14 after a couple of years okay. of trying to, because my parents gave me a Viewmaster thing, the, the little stereoscopic thing you look through, and, and I was fascinated by the images, so I took it apart and tried to figure out, you know, how are they getting these images in there? And so I, I started, just started reading about, you know, Charlie Chaplin, all these silent movie stars from back right. in the days, the 20s, as much as I could absorb about, um, about that time. So and you did have a TV was, at home? We did have a TV, it was a black okay. and white TV. Black and white. Um, and then what happened was I was in junior high school and we used to get these like uh, English classes filmed through English. You know, if you ever go through it, you know, they show movies, and you read books and stuff. And it was like a film communication class, but an English class. And, on TV? Uh, no, no, in, in junior high school. In school, okay, got yeah. it. Multi, like, what they call now multimedia course. Right, but back then it was like yeah. a, 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 an English through film because they would show you movies like Citizen Kane or whatever crap. Nice. Rent, and then they okay. would talk about it. And so one of the assignments were, I think the term assignment was, you could make a film. You could make a film, a little film, right? Or you could write a script. Well, right. I didn't have no film, so I wrote a script. So <laughs> I, I had my own, I had like an old, one of those old typewriters, you know, typed one like this. And I started. T- I couldn't type it, so I think my mom typed it for me, and I just. Of course, she did. <laughs> she, she, I dictated. She typed it. Out. Moms always do the 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 everything, the science project, all of that. Moms are the ones doing it so, all. <laughs> so I, I typed this little spy story and I sent it into the teacher, and I got like an A plus. He put it on the board and wrote, "This is how a script should be." And wow. I was really impressed. I was like, "Wow!" I mean, he said, "This is like a perfect script." I'm like, "Wow, thanks." So I thought, well, maybe I could do this. So I just started practicing typing myself. I mean, I didn't have an assignment. It took me a couple of years, but after a while, I got pretty proficient, pretty fast at it. Do you uh, remember the teacher's name? I can see him clearly, but I cannot you remember his name. That's fine. Remember his name. Oh, it, I, it's can see, I can see him clearly, though. 
but I don't remember his name. No. That's interesting. That's good. So yes, yeah, so I started writing because I realized, I, and, and it became it, it felt natural. So I started banging out stories, silly stories. You know, you're a kid, right? Uh, Those are the best stories, though, because um, you know you, know, you have an you imagination. You you had no you life live in one neighborhood. Basically. Yeah. Well, yeah, but I had no life experience. So all I would all I would write was stuff that you know is was I would you know, you'd see stuff on TV and then you so you were making a, so in other words the writers who wrote for television and plays were basing it on life or maybe stuff they had read. So you were getting like third generation. You were just watching their stuff instead of doing your own stuff. Because I'm still learning how to do right. it as well as you know the format and stuff. So. It, 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 looking back in it now, I thought it was, it was hot stuff, but back then it, kind of, it, it probably was very silly stuff. But it was a good practice, and, and I had no way to, I couldn't do anything with them because I had no way of filming them. So, when did you start your first, like, did you do photography first and then you went um, to film? Or you'd never yeah, did? I mean, my, yeah, yeah, I did. My parents had, you know, when the, the, the age of the Polaroid camera, the, the instant camera came in. So, I got fascinated by that and started. Doing instant photography, you know, for Polaroids. Uh, you know, they pull it out. And it, 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 it. Um, and I think finally what happened with my mom again for my birthday, I turned like 14 or 15 or something like that. She took a loan out and bought me a, a camera and a little projector and a little, you know, package thing. And then I started, you know, making films from that. And it was a big deal. She remember her telling me at the time, she said, I've never taken a loan out for anything, but I saw you really wanted to do this, so I, I'm, I'm gonna that's help awesome. you and do it. Do you still have it? Oh God, no, that's. Be... <laughs> what did it look like? Was it, it was made a, out of wood? No, it, it had a handle. It had a handle on it, and you had a hood like this. <laughs> you put the thing over. I'll tell you, like, you know, funny, it, it's funny you should say it did have like a trim on it, like a kind of a, a foamy wood plastic trim on it but it, it looked yeah. like a it was like one of those Kodak uh, whatever cameras Kodak made cameras it looked like a periscope almost like a binocular you okay. held it like this and a lens and a thing you could nice ability. and you put the little film cartridge in there and you shot with it I just loved that camera I thought it was so cool so what was your first film I you know this is embarrassing to say but you don't remember I, I no 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 I had no friends so I shot television. Really? Yeah, I put the camera up on the, the, under the my TV. TV screen, and I shot because there's no remember there's no video recorders back then, and I shot television for my first stuff. I mean, I shot some footage outside. So you were doing bootleg before. <laughs> yes, but what the reason why I shot television was so that I could study how they cut. Oh, I see. So I okay. could look at it and see. How did that cut to this, to this, to this, to this, to this, to this? So that when I made my own films, I could understand okay. shot, the first shot, and, and angle. So you were doing and YouTube could, on your own. Yeah. And pretty then much I, to learn. And then, I, and then I think I had a friend I met in high, uh, junior high school, a guy named Alex Lanou, uh, a Haitian kid. And uh, I told him I was making films. And Alex and I got together. We made uh, a little film in the woods <laughs> at the end of the block. <laughs> That Alex had an idea for a story, and we just made this little film of us running around doing police detective and criminal. While we're in the woods, I have no idea, but no so, one really So that. at that point, you were doing more filming and less writing, or did you, in your head, thought you had to write it and then, like, script it, or you were well, just freelancing? Like, you just... No, I always wrote it. Writing was, okay. had become really? second nature at that point. Okay. Yeah, writing had become second nature at that point. I mean... You know, you know, it's funny. I later met a few years later. I met some friends who were into making films, and the, they would make these comments about me, like, "Well, Mark, you do it like Hollywood." I'm like, "What do you mean? Well, you're out there like a script, and you do it doing." They, they would they, they would shoot their films, and they would call like editing in the camera. So then they'd say, "Okay, Wanda, walk, walk, right?" Right. right. They shoot you. Okay, stop. And they go ahead, okay, walk again. And they'd actually edit the film with the cameras. So when they pulled it out, it was all cut together again. But it always would have shots that would begin like this. <laughs> <laughs> and so I did it with, with the idea that I was going to edit it. So I shot 12 takes or something, okay. or six takes of this. So I knew I was going to cut it together later. And I think what it was is that they were, they were sort of 
they were sort of enjoying pretending being what they were making the film about. So if they were cowboys, if they were getting off on being cowboys. If they were spies, they were getting off being spies. I got off on feeling like a filmmaker. So right. I didn't the, so the much care about yeah. yeah, I didn't care so much what I was making a film about. I just like the structure of making the film. So I was getting that experience. And so that was, so I think that's why I was a little bit more. Did you, know, you name it? Did you have script. a little? Yeah, I did. I mean, well, back then, no, because we were silent movies. There was no sound. But a year or two oh. later, they came out with sound for these home movie cameras. Okay. And then I got to sleep. Uh, and then, yeah, I shot. But then you didn't oh, need so it. Oh, so back then, was... you had to do the sound separate from the yes. video? Yeah. And, I was and then you were the editing. So you did everything. You wrote it. Yeah. You filmed it. Yeah. You yeah. directed it. Yeah. And I and acted in it, too. Oh, okay. I you like you a, propped a, it I, somewhere? I put, <laughs> I put it on a tripod, right? Oh my God. It, right in front of like. <laughs> and you were in your teens at this point. You I was were a teenager. I was in junior high school, yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And did you ever give something to any of the schools for it? For well, here, now, here's, a, so here's the thing. So, so now we do the, the little silent movies and then we do sound. Mm -hmm. And then um, I, my mom. We moved because the neighbor moved. We moved to Flushing, to white people's Flushing, right. you know, which was really just. I love how you say that. Well, that's what it was. I mean, there was no more black people Flushing, white white people, but it was yeah. like it was like Main Street. It was like um, how do I describe it? Uh, it was very industrial. It was like stores and, oh, okay. and, it was, and it was the only house in this area. Another there's a house and there's a fire station across the street and a warehouse and it was like. The only house that was left in this must have been a huge development. They, they destroyed everything except this one wow. house. And, and the woman upstairs, the Italian lady, rented to us. So now I'm doing sound. My mom said, hey, listen, why, why don't you get out there and meet people? And I was a very shy kid. I'm like, I, I can't meet anybody. I, I, I don't know what to say to people. I'm not good with people. You need to go <laughs> out, she'd say. Go out and meet people. But there's nobody here. We're the only house. I mean, literally, there's just one house. There's no, there was, there was just a, there was, you know what? We know what's you know what was outside of our window? A parking lot. Wow. And downstairs there was a barber shop. And next door there was a warehouse. And across the street there was a firehouse and a church. That was it. And everything else was nothing but industrial stuff. So I said, well, you know what? There's a, there's a group in Jamaica at the library I heard. And there's a film group. And you can go and you can meet people. And, and they make films like you. Maybe you can meet them. I'm not going. I'm, I'm not going there. <laughs> you need to go. We argue about it. I didn't go. The next year went on, I was still trying to make films. She convinced me to go and I went. And when I got there, I'm like 14 or 15. All the people in the, in the library in this group are like in college. <laughs> they're like they're like in college, they're like 19, 20, 20 years old guys. And they're watching like, you know, like these esoteric black and white films from, you know, the Netherlands. <laughs> <laughs> hey, watch and, it. Oh, and, what's you know, the Netherlands now? North Holland. Look, 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 and they're like, you know, people are going like this now. <laughs> and the only thing these guys aren't doing is smoking a pipe. Well, I think the essence and of in the film is blah, 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 blah. I'm, I'm like this. Like, what? And they said, what do you think, Mark? And was, I remember this, this librarian named Carol. And, you know, you sit in the back and you're the black kid, right? Because we're all like these white kids, right? I said, so, Mark, we're having a different. What do you think, Mark? Well. I think it kind of sucks. <laughs> and they all, laughed like, they all laughed like you did. And there's one black guy, one black guy who sat in the back, further back. And he never said anything, anything. He was like the spook that sat by the door in that CIA movie, you know. What do you think he was doing? Just observing and... He just was observing. And yeah. so I used to go back to, yo, why don't you, why don't you ask this guy a question, you know? Exactly. And it turned to be my friend Mike Nero. And what happened... Get out! Was, it turned out I met Mike at this place, and he would, you know, we, he would always laugh at the jokes. I cracked jokes because I didn't know enough about. Wow! So you know Mike theory. all the way back then. Yes, and one day we went back and talked, and the guy he said, "Listen, why don't you come to my house?" He said, "I, I'm, I make films too, you know, and uh, I'll show you my setup." I'm like, setup? What setup? What are you talking about setup? I get on the bus. I got there. I got to his house. He was in this part of Jamaica, the Blacks action. Uh, and so we get in there, you know, and he, he's got, he lives in this like basement apartment and he opens his closet door and there's like all these like costumes, like, you know, military wow. police 
And they were all like homemade. The other day he had taken clothing and refashioned it to make it into whatever he needed. He had masks and he had props and his father would help him. His sisters were into it. All the guys in the neighborhood were his like crew. I'm like, well, you know, Jamaicans, you know, come on now. I'm, but no, I'm like, look, I'm like, everybody's everything. But I'm like, he had, a, he had a dummy. He had a human dummy that he'd made. <laughs> like he had to throw off the buildings and stuff. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So I'm like, and he drove. So I'm like, what the hell? I'm like, you know, I, it's me. So he's so Mark, what do you got? <laughs> Just me. Just me, yeah. yeah. So we got together, we started hanging out, and um, I told him about some ideas I had. He said, well, hey, I'll, I'll help you make the film. So I started making films with Mike. And it's a funny thing, because we made this really elaborate film, OK? So we're making this big film. It took us like months and months to shoot. It's like a half an hour, hour long film. I'm directing, and I'm writing it. I'm in it. His friends are in it. You know, we're doing stunts. We're doing all this kind of crazy stuff. You we're have hair. Movies. I have hair. <laughs> So we make this big elaborate film. Right? Mike's editing it. We're, we're doing all this stuff. We're doing all this stuff, right? So we have a premiere at his basement and a couple of people's basements because back then there's no YouTube. We went to the basement. Mm -hmm. So, but I go to high school now and uh, I have a film class, right? Film English class. <laughs> and the, the teacher says, hey, if you have a film that you want to show, you may, you know, bring it in. I think he's thinking of those little reels you got to put in the projector. I bring this freaking reel to come in. And I showed my film in class. And it was so long, I had to show it in two parts. OK. And uh, I'll never forget, on the second day, when we came back to class, like the following week, he said, so Mark is going to finish showing us his opus <laughs> today. <laughs> and I said, OK. I said, this is going. And so at the end of the thing, everybody kind of clapped. And I got up and I talked about it. The first time I ever got up and talked about my film. I said, by the way, I'm thinking about making another film. Anybody interested in being in, let me know. All the hands shot up, right? Every, now I'm like, everybody. So that you know they liked it. Everybody wants to be in it. So I get some numbers and I write a new script. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to do it and do like I did it with Mike. But Mike is busy now. Mike's like five years older than me. And I guess Mike's into other things, you know. And, and I'm like 15 or 16. And so. Uh, so he can't make it. So what the hell? I, I don't need Mike. I, <laughs> I wrote this thing. I directed it. I was in it. I can do it. I'm Mike. I got all these other guys mm -hmm. that help me. And so we go into the lot again, the woods, <laughs> which I've moved away from, by the way. We had moved okay. away at this place. Right. It didn't matter. I still go back there. And so we go to the woods. And we, I got a dozen kids running around and setting up cameras. And, we're, and, it, and it's hot. It's hot, like one of those hot summer days, like a heat wave. It's New hot. York, oh. And we're wearing like clothing because we're like astronauts. So it's like a parody, like the Planet of the Apes, where like it's jumpsuits. And, and because we're supposed to be like the, the Planet of the Apes guys, right? We had beards, these sticky beards we had glued onto our faces, melting. And, and I'm shooting everything in it. That's funny. And it's not, go, it's not going well. And by the end of the day, it was just a fiasco. And I learned a very important lesson that day that. <clears throat> I thought I made that film that I showed in class. And really, I realized that Mike was as important to that film as anything. And that by trying to do something elaborate like that without him, I fell on my face. Everybody got pissed at me. Everybody stopped talking to me. It was like one of those humiliating experiences I never had. And that's what I learned early on that in a film, one person drives the movie. It's like driver's seat. And you can tell who that person who drives is when they don't show up, nothing gets done. And I thought I was driving when I made my films. And it was really Mike that was driving. I was just along for the ride. And both uh, euphemistically and actually, because when we drove anywhere, I didn't drive, he had drive, so I didn't. So he not only drove, but he was driving the film as well. Right. And so uh, it took me a while to regroup and to really kind of eat that humble pie and to rethink my priorities to make a film without Mike, but it had to be much simpler and I couldn't be in it. I had to make right. sure I was behind the camera. I had to make sure that, you know, we knew what we were doing. And so I reapproached some of the people in school and explained, look, I learned a lot. I made a mistake. I'm going to make another film. Would you be in it? Most said no. They didn't want to come out again because they came out during the summer vacation, right? And 
expected this awesome experience. It was just a hodgepodge. But one guy said yes, one. And so I said, okay, great. So come on out. And I got some film, some film Mike's people who, who weren't there that day, thank God. Mm-hmm. And they came out and I made this film over a period of a couple of months on after school and weekends, we shot this film. And it turned out okay. And I, and I learned that as long as I didn't over tax myself, I could do it. I knew that it was important that I could only make things that I could control and not to go right. on. So it was a very important lesson that, that I learned that day. And this is your first year of high school, right? This is my, this is probably, yeah, no, yeah. Well, high school for me was 10th grade. So yes, it was my first year because um, junior high school went up to ninth grade and then high school's, I didn't enter as a freshman, I entered as a sophomore. So yeah, okay. so my first year of high school, 10th grade. Yeah. And then after that, I made the film and then I would get out that I had done another film and I approached more people in school. And by 11th grade, I made a, another movie uh, and now all was forgiven and everyone was drifting back to me again when they heard that I was sort of learning my lessons. I made a lot of other little films along the side, but I would make these really more complex projects, you know, that were like half an hour, 40 minutes long with uh, complex stories. And uh, and then, you know, a couple of people who were in my films started wanting to produce my films. They wanted to help me organize. They wanted, they wanted to do more than just be in them. They wanted to get into the nitty gritty yeah. of, yeah, and, and help me make them. And so I, I, you know, we formed a little film group within the school and, uh, you know, I was able to uh, shoot uh, more complex films. And so right through, you know, high school, right into the, my, really my first year of college. So how did you find time to be a student in high school? And... I wasn't was a good student. <laughs> Okay, and write scripts because I've read I've read some of your scripts and you're a great writer. Um, uh, well, I think it's this. I think that you know everything we do mm-hmm. is based on emotion. Really? You, you, yeah, you don't do anything unless you're emotionally ready to do it. And I give you a perfect example. Okay. For years, I never saved money, and it's because I wasn't emotionally ready to save money. I mean. I don't have enough money to save. I can't save. When meanwhile, you know, you're buying most of the crap you don't need, and that's money you could save. I think that emotionally, we're not ready to save it. I think that we stay in bad relationships, bad marriages because we're emotionally not ready. Sometimes it's something as simple as you know, you catch somebody cheating on you, right? But sometimes something just it just breaks, and you're ready. It doesn't matter whether it makes sense or not. It doesn't matter whether it's going to impact right. you or not. You're just out of this relationship. You're leaving this job. You're going to write this script. And at that point, I had been writing a couple, couple of years, so writing was secondary to me. I could write, you know, I could muscle my way through scripts. And they were right. short scripts. They weren't like 100 pages. No, 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 I got it. They were like 10, 15, 20-page scripts. So I could bang those out in, in a matter of, you know, a couple of days or a week or whatever. And you had to rewrite them several times anyway, right? Because those days there was no computer. You had to write the script, mark it up with a pen, and retype the script again. So you got pretty good at, you know, at, at doing it after a while. You can write the same script like four or five times. Um, and so emotionally, I think I was just ready to do uh, it. And so I made the time for it. And and like I said, I wish I could tell you that everything I ever attempted to do or write or make came out right. It didn't. There was a lot of stumbles along the way. There was, you know, things I started I couldn't finish or things I, you know, wrote and wanted to make and couldn't get to make or things I started shooting and just didn't work out. I think you just make time for what's important. And that has nothing to do with filmmaking. That has to do with anything. Look at um, J.K. Rowland or Mary Higgins Clark. You know, they, she wrote these mysteries and they worked a full-time job and raised their kids. And every night when they came home, after they made the kids dinner, put them to bed, they sat at the typewriter at the kitchen table and wrote their novels. And I'm sure there's thousands of people like that, but they... Uh, just to get the novels published, or maybe they got them published and they weren't popular. Because you know, right. just you know, you can make a film, uh, but if nobody sees it, and it wasn't a YouTube, it wasn't any kind of um, distribution network. You know, you were sh- screening these things in church basements and you know, in veterans of foreign war hall, schools, and schools, 
people so theater, anywhere, you yeah. could, anywhere you could get 10 or 15 people together and you roll up a picture screen and you, you, you played the film. So you're so in you, high you school, them. still with hair. Yes, still with hair. <laughs> and then you graduate. This is a choice, by the way. Okay. I know. And then you graduate. Yes. They asked me to leave this. <laughs> <laughs> you need to leave now. You can leave now. Um, and then you went to the School of Visual Arts. School of Visual Arts, yes. Well, How not did right that... away. I actually, I didn't get in right away. Okay. I was in the last year of high school, and everyone was, you know, they did the SAT things. I told you I was a bad student. I didn't study. I didn't read the You weren't a bad student. Let's switch I that. I you just wasn't any, interested. I didn't, in the, in any, the... I didn't read Silas yeah. Martin or any of those books that they told you to read. I faked my way through everything. And I, I got you out. did a good whatever. job. I, I'm good at faking it. Well, so, you're, good, you're, you're a good, you know, writer. Faker. No, so, so I was in I was in the last year of high school and everyone's getting these letters back. Oh, I got accepted to Cornell. Oh, I got accepted here. I got accepted to Yale. I'm like, wow. I said, would you, would you go more? I didn't even think to even. My parents told me what? straight up, we can't afford to send you to college. So Wait, it wasn't like, free when you were your age? No. No, oh. no, it, it cost money. But then it was it started. Okay. And so um, they said, we can't afford to send you to college. So I don't know what to tell you. Uh, you might have take loans or something. So I was just going to, I don't know. I was going to go to community college. And so community college was like, I think, you know, you got TAP and BOJ, it covered like the $400 a semester, whatever it was. And uh well, I was in high school when I was at the last year. Somebody said, "Oh, I got accepted to the School of Visual Arts." I'm like, "What's that? What's the, it's a film school. It's an art college. They have film schools." I said, yeah, <laughs> I want to go to that. Yeah, that, that's that's me. What did I know about this? Because I didn't sit down with a recruiter. I mean, I was right. I was doing crappy grades, and no guidance counselor said, "Oh, Mark, you should go to the Visual Arts." Of course not. They still don't do that. So, but okay. You know, so you know, I. Couldn't apply. It was too late. It was already like you know, okay. I don't know, March or something like that. You couldn't apply. They already sent up the notices. <laughs> so I said, you know, I'll just go to Queens Girl College and just go there and I'll apply for visual arts for a year. When I got to Queens Girl College, I was so disappointed. It was like this community college. Everybody was kind of lackadaisical. It was really, it was, it was just kind of like, eh. Uh, there was a film club, but it was like a waste of time. So I dropped out after a semester. I, I banged around with this guy doing improv. Um, okay. My friend Michael hooked me up with him, and I did that for six months. Uh, improv, Your other Michael friend. My other Michael friend, <laughs> and uh, and then when Visual Arts called me up and they accepted me, I went. I took a loan out and went to Visual Arts. Okay. And when I got there, uh, was equally disappointed. <laughs> Why? What happened? I think that. Going to film school back then in the 70s was great if you knew nothing about film. But if you had a rudimentary knowledge of film, That's Larry true. had a pretty, it was it was very, um, not boring, but just, I just knew every, I knew a lot of the stuff they were teaching already. And after a while, the teachers were like, well, Mark, obviously you know this stuff, so just chill out. But you don't want to hear that in class. You want to, you, you, you expect them you to- You want to engage, teach, yeah. You want to teach you something. You want to hands on. And you don't get that until like your second or third year. I thought, okay. oh my God, I got to do two years of, of, of them. <laughs> and this is what a camera is. And this is what a shot is. is so they, they didn't have like an exam or anything to just they advance? They, well, oh. they had, they had, they, they didn't even look, no, they, they wanted to get you for four years. They wanted to get four years worth of money out of you. Matter of fact, I remember it was my second year, I was in an editing class. And uh, the teacher there, I was. We were, they used to give us like um, old episodes of uh, TV shows to edit, and they gave us like Gunsmoke, the old TV question Gunsmoke. And so you would sync that up and you'd edit it, and you, they'd give you the footage and you cut it. And I remember the editing teacher come up to me and say, Hey, this looks pretty good. I said, You know, Mark, you know what? I can write you a letter uh, to get you into a master's program at NYU because you, you really get some talent. Wow. And I thought to myself, Master. Your master's degree. <laughs> so me, I could do like, Four years of this shit, and then another <laughs> two years of that. Uh, I think I'm, I'm going to pass that. You sure? Because you really should. I'm going to go out there and make movies. I'm not going to 
spent You're six funny. years in school. You know, yeah. so of course I passed on that one. Look, famous last words, right? I would have met Spike Lee probably because he was that was the class he was in. Oh, get out. Yeah, that would have been the class he was in. We're the same age, we'd have been that had been the same time we went to school. Uh, but again, I couldn't afford NYU. NYU was some phenomenal amount of money. I mean, I was already in debt up to my eyeballs for visual arts. Uh, it's, still, so. it's still expensive, and I really don't know how how students do it, you know. Well, at the time I went to visual arts, I think it was 2000 a semester, 4000 a year, so $16,000 for education. That's a lot. That was a lot back in the 70s. I right? know. But it's not anywhere compared to probably just like it's a quick, It's if you think about it, it's almost equivalent to what it is now. What is it now? A hundred thousand per Probably, year? Yeah. 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 But at the time, so I left after the second year. I, I I left and decided just to strike out on my own and do it. A lot of my, a lot of my contemporaries did too, who actually went on to do quite a bit of work to work on a lot of movies. No so, one, back in those days, they said if you went to film school with the whole four years, then you weren't really a filmmaker. I I, I believe. Do you think stu students should take that money and just invest it in filming <laughs> or, or learning well, well, that's an old, that's actual, a, like a mentor? Well, that's an old argument that you hear. Okay. I think that um, I think the road is different each and every person. If you had asked me that like 20 years ago, I would have said yes. Uh, but keep in mind, I didn't have the money. So it wasn't a matter of me saying, oh, I have this money. I'm not going to spend on education. I'm going to make a film with it. I didn't have that. It was all loans and, and taps. It wasn't like I could go and get $16,000 and make a movie with it. True. Um, that's like for the, the, the kids whose parents are like, oh, we saved this college fund for you. Here's here's $100,000. Go to you know, Cornell for six months. Uh, I think that the, the good thing about film school that I can see to these days, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a four-year college, is that you make network connections uh people you meet like-minded people nobody really makes a film by themselves i do not make films by myself and yet often i'll be working six different positions on it but i still don't write my own music i form that out i don't do my own visual effects i form that out um when i can not often i farm out editing but when i can not often i try and get somebody to shoot it for me um, i don't do makeup on the actors I try not to do craft services. I try and farm that out. Um, it, 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 what, when you do everything on a film, I think what happens is you cheat yourself of the experience of collaboration. Because that's what film is. It's collaborating. Novels, people, even people who write novels, they have editors. They don't just write a novel and here you go. Right. They have a, an editor, and the editor looks at the book, and you cut this out, and change this. And, and often editors will actually rewrite your book without even asking you, saying this, I recut this, I made this smaller, you know. And so we don't know what unedited books look like. Any book you've ever picked up has gone through a publishing editor, maybe two. We don't know what the unedited version of, of The Stand is or a Stephen King novel. I mean, have that's why you, they... Have you ever written a book that turned into a film or everything you've done is no, it's always it's always been screenwriting. Yeah. I mean, I, I've I've written essays and I've written um, treaties, you know, but novels are real writing, not the kind of crap I do. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you have to really understand, you know, syntax. And I've read, and that was the other thing when I was first writing screenplays. I never read a book. I don't think I ever read a book like for enjoyment until I was probably like twenty one or twenty twenty one. And you re you've read a lot of books. Now, because that and, and and the reason why I never read is I didn't know how to read. And not only I didn't know how to read in the sense I couldn't read it, I didn't know how to read and visualize what I was reading. I didn't know how to transition the, words the page into some kind of visual image that I could see in my head. It just felt like words. And so a girlfriend of mine in school, we went to see a movie called Nunzio, made by this guy, I'll never forget his name, James Andronica. And he's about these Italian kids in Brooklyn. And we saw we would go to the movies all the time back then because that was like a cheap form of entertainment. And so we went to see Nunzio. And I'll never forget, like a couple of weeks later, she brought me this book. It was Nunzio, it was a paperback version. In other words, they had taken the, the movie and novelized it, yeah. which they did back then a lot of times. Yes. And she said, Here, read this because you've seen the movie and then you can sort of visualize what you're seeing. And of course, there was stuff in the book that wasn't in the movie. 
because whoever novelized it expanded on the screenplay. Mm -hmm. And but for the first time, because I had seen the actors play the characters, I could hear their voices, I knew what they were dressed like, I knew what their apartments looked like. I was able to translate the words on a book page into a visual pictures in my mind, and it's like something snapped, and I suddenly said, "Oh, that's what you get out of reading." Okay. And after that, it just I, I I got it now. I could do it backwards. I can now visualize characters, whether it was a tale of two cities or mice and men, or and you can crap. also tell a good book, a good visual book from a bad one. A bad one. <laughs> And so yeah. I read voraciously and I read all the time. And and the, the more I wrote, the better I got as a writer because not only could I write dialogue now, but I could also write descriptive passages better. And when I started really writing in earnest, but away from the little like little three page and twelve page and fourteen page scripts, I started writing features, right. I could take some of my favorite authors and write in their voice in the stage directions. So it flowed and that helped me a lot. So what was one of your first films that had color in it? <laughs> was and sound, and sound, sound, and sound. Had actors, friends. What was the first one? Well, probably after college. So um, I think I made this little film based on it. I, 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 I started writing features and uh, I think I think I wrote some little short film or something. I tried to get a theater. It's called Sneak Attack about this kind of vampire and this priest. So like a kind of a parody of The Exorcist. Um, really? Yeah. And we tried to get it to theaters. We weren't able to get it. We shot it in 35 millimeter film, which is what they shoot movies on, you know, big movies on. And we cut it and we put it together, but we couldn't quite get a theater to pick it up or distribute it. But it was really like a regular movie. movie. I remember writing this script. Uh, I remember when I was in college, I wrote this short film for a thesis project called Eddie Valone, about this kind of detective. And I needed a place to edit it. And I, I wound up going to answer an ad or something or finding this guy named John Carter. And John was like an African-American film editor. And he was like a rarity. He was African American, what we call black, um, but he had worked on big Hollywood movies. Like he cut the Karate Kid, he cut, he cut like big movies. And uh, I rented from him because he had extra editing equipment. He had this apartment on 8th Avenue and, and 50th Street. He had these rooms, the bedrooms were all like little editing suites. And I remember renting from him for like $75 for a week, which was you know, not a lot of money, but it was a good piece of change. And uh, we get to he would come in and out, you know, and I talked to him and you know, we say a few words. And somehow or another, I think I told him I was writing. And he said, Oh, really? He said, Well, I'm thinking about directing. He said, You know, I, mean, I always want to direct movies, and if I could find a good script, you know, I would do one. So I said, Well, you one of my scripts. And so I gave it to him. I remember I had a job at the time, I think he was working in a perfume factory or something. You know. <laughs> It's weird, it's like a perfume dist distributor. It's just perfume distributor. And John called me at work. He had my number. And he said, hey, it's John. I said, hey, John. He said, I have to ask you a question. I said, sure, absolutely. We, we want to know. So I'm good. I want, you, I want you to tell me the truth, though. I don't want you to lie to me. And I said, okay. What is it? Did you write this script? Yeah, of course I wrote it. I'm serious. Did you, did you really, you didn't, you're not like, Somebody else didn't write this script and give it to you to give to me, you know, like because they couldn't get to me. In other words, they wanted they wanted to use you to get to me. Like, yeah, tell John you wrote this, you know. I said, yes. He says, because I got to tell you, this is fantastic. He said, and I've read Hollywood scripts. I'm going to send it out to a producer, you know, a couple of weeks ago. This is really good, Mark. I'm like, I'm, how old are you? I'm like 20, 21. He said, Holy crap. He said, I gave it to my wife to read. And we're like, we're looking at like, could a kid have written this? I'm like, wow, thank you. I guess I should be very flattered. <laughs> I mean, I knew I was good, but you know, I knew, but I didn't know. But you know, you know, I did. I didn't know. No, I knew, but not the Karate Kid guy, you know. You know. But... <laughs> so, so it's okay. So let me, uh, let me know. So anyway, he sends it out, and uh, I'm in and out now. So, so okay. So a couple of things happened with John. So I get to his office, 
And uh, I said, yeah, I need another week to cut my film. He goes, oh, don't, 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 don't worry about that. Those that it, your money's so good. Here's, here's keys to my office. Come and go as you please. Really? Oh, well, okay. <laughs> well, okay, thank you. <laughs> um, and he said, so I sent it out to wow. so-and-so, and, and, this and, that. and he sent me back this letter, this guy over at Paramount. I want you to read the letter. I'm like, wow, okay, Paramount Pictures. Oh. <laughs> Mark's moving in the big time. <clears throat> Dear John, what a great script. Too bad nobody wrote it. Well, what does this mean, John? It's basically saying that you're not anybody to write a script like this and they can't push it. Wow. But they, they discover people all the time. He said, eh, that's yeah. what they tell you. Somebody has a rabbi pushing for that person. But I mean, they could discover me and then I'll be somebody. He's like, I just think he just doesn't want to do me the favor, Mark. But what I want you to do this. I want you to be my writer. I want you to write scripts for me. I'm going to direct something. If I get a script in, I want you to read it. And based on that, if it needs rewriting, I'll get you a job hired as the writer to rewrite it. Because every director has his own writer. Okay, in the meantime, here's the keys to my office, blah, blah, blah. And I would go in John's office, I did my little movie, and occasionally when he was there, he had this Rolodex on the desk. You know, the old Rolodex? Those yeah, no, the nobody, you know, young oh, now knows what well, that is, but yeah. Rolodex, it's like, it's the contact list. <laughs> and so one day I was flipping through his Rolodex, you know? He had like every name in Hollywood in there with their name and number. Oh, and number, address. everything. Bill Cosby, you're flipping the old Sidney Portier, you know, you're flipping the... I'm like, holy crap, all I have to do is, like, you know, put... But, you know, of course, it, you know, because people don't like you going through their shit. Well, that's why so, they, trust, they trust you. I mean. So anyway, so we went back and forth for a couple of years. I wrote one script after the next because now I knew how to turn out scripts, right? So now I'm turning out feature scripts. Okay. I write the horror film. Then I write a love story. Then I write uh, this. I'm writing this. I'm banging out scripts. I'm banging out two, three, four, five scripts a year, right? You know, because I got to get something to hook them with. He's loving them, but, you know, he's not. Pushing them on, pushing on. So, so then I meet another person who's like a, a black person in Hollywood, and it turns out she knows John. She's like a producer in Hollywood, and it turns out there's a club. It turns out there's like a club of black filmmakers in Hollywood, and they all know each other. Like the white people are saying, "Oh, we all go to the club, and we all know each mm -hmm, other." Mm -hmm. And and once a year, they all meet at Astoria Studios and have this like big chapter meeting. So John says, I want to bring you to the meeting. Okay. <laughs> so we go to Astoria Studios, right? And in it is everybody who's like anybody in the freaking world, like in like the black Oscars, right? And who's there but Spike Lee? Get out. So I run into the producer, Grace Blake is her name. Oh, Mark, I'm glad John brought you, blah, blah, you know? Thanks. You want to meet Spike Lee? Sure. So I walk up. Spike, this is Mark Camber. He's a writer and a director himself. Oh, hey, this is how Spike looks like. Hey, man, what's up, man? You mean with his face up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like this. Is uh, I said, okay. He had just done She's Got to Have It. He, he hadn't shot wow. School Days yet. He, was, he had the money for that. And uh, I sit down, you know, next to John, and I'm looking behind me, and, and Ossie Davis, you know, the, who was pretty, you know, gets up in front of the podium and says, I just want you to know that Bill Cosby couldn't be here because he's in LA shooting some thing, but he sends his regards and normally everybody's like here. And he said, I want to introduce you to our latest brother over here, Spike Lee. Spike has gone through the valley of the shadow of white people and stayed black. And I want us to all give our attention. To and so they have this big meeting and they talk about kind of like where the industry is going, what they can do to help each other and network and stuff. And I was revitalized. I didn't even know there was such a consortium of people like this that existed. And that I got actually to be invited to this thing. I mean, I was Joe Nobody, right? But I was like, right. felt like I was up and coming. And so after that, I, in earnest, no, 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 I know what it was. After that, Grace, um, 
I asked Chris if I could get on Spike's new movie on school days. And she said, no, he's using all his friends and stuff. But I'm going to produce Spike's movie. But I can't get you on it. But I can tell you something else. Uh, the, there was these producers who had this music group called something. And they wrote this song called Doing the Butt. Sexy, sexy. And they have money. And they're putting together a movie about Stevie Wonder. And they're looking for writers. And I showed them one of your scripts. And they showed it to Stevie Wonder, you know, they read it. And he wants to see you in Hollywood. Get out of here. <laughs> no crap. They call me up, they fly me out to Hollywood. They put me up in the Beverly Hills Hotel. They tell me, listen, here's a pager, because that's how long ago it was, right? When Stevie wants you to meet you for this interview, They'll page you. You get to a phone, and you call, and they'll have a car come pick you up. And it could be at like 3 o'clock in the morning. Because whenever he gets up, he has no sight. That's when he goes to work. Right. So just be ready. So I'm in the hotel, you know. <laughs> I don't drive, right? I'm 24 now, 25 years old. I don't drive. I'm with these producers. They're still doing business. I knew a person over at Capitol Records because I had they were trying to get me to direct music videos back then. And I kept getting fired off the music videos. The producers would hire me and the record company would fire me because they wanted their directors. It was all this power struggle thing. The, 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 so who could get control of the video? So I knew them, I hung out with them during the day and then I'm waiting by the phone, you know, for the, the thing to go off, you know. And uh, finally I get the beep and I, I go, get driven to Wonderland. That's what they call it, Wonderland. <laughs> and it, it's, I swear to God. And it's in the middle of West Hollywood. It's this kind of art deco kind of, uh, not brown stuff. It's kind of like this hacienda kind of thing. And it had SW, you know, it's carved into the front like Stevie Wonder. And they were like, you know, Mercedes and Cadillacs and every kind of expensive car you could see parked in the driveway. And outside, the, the, the side of the house was a hermetically sealed like NASA trailer, like one of those big silver trailers, you know, the ones that you see NASA, but didn't have NASA inside it. And, <laughs> and, and that was his recording studio. And wow. so we go in and he's in there and he's recording with skeletons in the closet. That's what he's recording while I'm walking in. And I'm standing there like this and I'm like, okay, don't worry about it. He's like, he's like, yo, somebody get me a switch, man. And he's, and he's talking just, you know, with, and so he says, so he finishes recording. I said, okay, that's good. You know what? And he said, oh, Stevie, so and so is on the phone with you. And I said, listen, I told you, I don't want any phone calls when I'm recording. Okay. So tell him whatever. So he said, listen, gentlemen, uh, I'm almost finished here. Why don't you go out and sit inside, you know, get, get, have something to drink or something, you know, I'll be right out. So I, I go inside Wonderland proper, which is gorgeous, like mansion. Yeah. And I'm sitting on the steps, and uh, there's a musician standing there. There's a musician sitting next to me. And I look at, we, we both look at each other. <laughs> and I said, uh, he said, man, you, uh, what are you here for? So I'm here, you know, to maybe write Stevie's life story. And the guy goes, you must be really good. And I'm like, you oh, know, I was thinking the same thing about you. <laughs> so uh, this white woman comes out. Right? No, 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 I'm sorry. No, this black woman comes out. White woman's somewhere else. But black woman comes out and she looks, she is like fine. She's like the finest black woman I've ever seen in my life. Okay. I mean, like, you ever see that ash from the I'm 24. No, I'm just saying in general. I, oh, no, I'm like. At that time, like, ever seen in your life, the finest black woman. But I mean, I'm talking about like, I've seen TV, right? I mean, she was like, okay, you know. Okay. <laughs> and, but you ever see like Ashford and Simpson, you know, those music groups? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, she was. Ashford Simpson fine, you know, like that kind of fine, like like Haley Berry fine, you know. And so I'm like, oh God, and this is Stevie's woman. And all I'm thinking to myself is, how does this nigga, how does he know what she look like? <laughs> does he like, <laughs> does he like, you know? He touched her wrist. So she says, hi, I'm here just to get you ready. So listen, Stevie's almost recording. And when he comes in, you know, um, like don't ask him for an autograph. He doesn't give autographs, but he might give you a thumbprint. And um, you might touch your face. 
uh, and that's just how he's going to see you. He might take your arm because he doesn't use a cane or a dog. So you'll just guide him through, okay? And uh, just, you know, talk to him regular. He's really looking forward to seeing you. He's heard some of your stuff. So in the meantime, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a game room in here and, and there's TVs on in every room, Wanda. I'm like, why is there TVs in here? Oh, he likes the sound, the TVs. He has mics in all the rooms. He records everything and he samples it later. Wow. He says, okay, so um, this is the game room. Uh, this is a, a air hockey. He loves air hockey. So if he challenges you to a game, don't feel bad. He, he plays really well. You can tell from the sound that the puck makes where it hits. And so it's okay for you to play. You don't have to hold back. And all the soda machines have beer in it. So just hit it and the beer will drop down. And you can have this. She's like running down. And I'm like, okay, okay. <laughs> beer. And then I, said, I said, so he's really good at air hockey? She said, oh, he's extremely good. Said, so if, like if I want to get the advantage on him, should like when he comes in, should I like, like trip him or something, you know? <laughs> he said, I don't think that would be a good idea. She said, I don't think that would be a good idea, but, you know. <laughs> Did she so, laugh at least? Yeah, yeah she's laughing. I, okay. I was 24. You know, I was a wise ass. You know? <laughs> so, so, you know, we go in and he comes. Finally, I get to talk to the pastor first. And I said, you know, he said, uh, he said, how are you? He said, I said, I'm, I'm good, Mr. Wonder. I, I, I got to tell you, I, I'm a big fan. I mean, I'm, I, you know, I've, I have like all your albums, both of them, you know. And he says, well, thank you. I've read everything you've read, both of them. And he told me. She was going, we're talking, and, you know, we have this great conversation. I don't remember what it was about. We were just talking mess. And um, about 20 minutes into it, you know, um, he gets called away for some business. He said, I'm sorry, I just got to go. And he said, you know, Michael Jackson was just in here, and he just missed him. And Steven Spielberg just left, doing whatever. And I would have introduced you to them when they were here, but, you know, they're, they're gone. But I like you, man. So let's, let's pick this conversation up again. Did you get and, to take a picture? No, no pictures. Wow. So he said, no pictures, no autographs. Maybe he'd give you a thumbprint. That's it. Very that's, like, that's the autograph type of thing? Thumbprint. I thought that was his autograph. And I was going to ask him for an autograph. I, mean, I, I was coming off as a yokel as it is, right? I mean, I was young, Wanda. I remember going into meeting the producer the first time they came in. And uh, I turned to this woman and I said, look, you know, um, I feel like I shouldn't be here. You know, I, I'm only like, like 24 years old. You know, I mean, I, this is like a big picture, you know? And she said, don't feel bad. I'm only 26. Wow. And so I said, oh, okay. <laughs> and so, like, there's this white girl. That's this white girl. So there's white girls in there, and she's like, fine. And so I'm playing air hockey with her, and I'm thinking, myself, oh, man, I'd like to like, get with this, right? <laughs> And and because you know you've got that this this part of the brain's thinking it, but this part of the brain's what's driving the ship. Right. And um, so afterwards we were talking. I was like, yeah, this might work out. He said, you know, we looked at your script; it was really good. So these are the people who like scream my shit to get at this nigga. I said, and I, I watched the music video you directed. I was really impressed with it. I said, yeah, you know, if they make a movie, maybe I could do like some of the music videos for, you know, the for the the, the songs he writes, right? Right. And uh, she says, yeah, I was really impressed by you did the thing. And she's, and she's like, like, she's like critiquing, like when they watched it a bunch of freaking times and, and knew like what it was. She's laying it out for me, right? And she said, so that's why we, we really thought you'd be good to meet him for this, you know, because we had, they had like all sorts of people rolling through there. So blah, 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 blah. I'm thinking, I'm saying, yeah, I'm in like shade. This chick thinks my work. Stevie, right? And all of a sudden the, the, the black chick who's 26 years of producer comes in and they start kissing. I'm like, Damn. <laughs> Damn. And I'll admit, for that one more, I thought, maybe, nah, I, I, I don't, no sense blowing that. No. Sense, no. no sense. But if I, you know, I, 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 I. So, <laughs> so, yeah, so I go back to New York and uh, these, other, these other producers when I was in LA told me about the story about some crap or something that they had an idea for this antique furniture uh phony antique furniture it turns out a lot of people have paintings and antiques that are forgeries and the only way they right. find out about them is when they go to insure them and then they find out that they're not real but they spent like huge amounts of money to buy them right 
So the FBI apparently, this is based on a real case that these lawyers handled, found out that these phony antiques, these Chippendales, these you know Louis the Fifteenth chairs, whatever, were made, being made in Jamaica by yeah. the Jamaicans. They had a way of aging the wood and even making the old time nails that they tapped in. And so, so how they found out about it is they broke into a brownstone in Washington D.C. and found the tools for making phony furniture and traced that sucker back to Jamaica where they were actually being constructed and taken apart and shipped to the United States and reassembled again. So they had an idea for a movie about that. So I said, well, I don't want to see one depiction you. Maybe I could write a treatment or something for you. You could, you know, pass it on. So I wrote a treatment for a movie called Replica. Uh, and I sent it to the producers. They paid me whatever, two or three thousand dollars for the treatment. And I guess the Stevie Wonder producers got it and they called me up and said, listen, um, we saw the treatment you wrote for the other guys. We'd like you to write a treatment like that for us while we're, we're waiting for you to get together with Stevie again. And I said, but we didn't talk enough. I mean, I don't, Right. I, I didn't get any autobiographical material from him. And, I mean, what about the album? It's going to be based on the album. You know, the album is out. Can I get tapes or something? He said, well, the album's coming out. So just go and buy a copy of the album and listen to it and write some <laughs> treatment. I'm like, what? It doesn't work like that. These guys told me a detailed story. I, you know, I fleshed it out. You can't just say, you know, oh, here, take this and write a treatment. About it. Make this. And so I kind of called up the money people who I met and said, listen, I got this weird phone call. And I'm not quite sure how to handle it. And then and when I asked her about how much money and, and she said, oh, we'll work it out. Just just do it. And I don't feel comfortable with it. We'll talk to her. So they talked to her and then I was fired. She called me up and fired me. Wow. Yeah. So moving forward, because it's been almost an hour and a half. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I love your stories, by the way. They're very interesting and and I was raped in prison because of it. Okay. That, that hopefully, spices hopefully, it. You, <laughs> hopefully you you have a, a good journal of your stories. Um, and if you don't, you should start filming them. I don't know. But I'm gonna go over a couple of the trailers of your films, your mm -hmm. recent films. Yeah, so now we're gonna jump forward to all the misery and stuff yeah. and get to write the good stuff, right? Sorry to make and... the awards. Yeah, how many awards have you won? And for what? Uh, a lot, right? I won a few. I won for Blind Side, and I won, I think, uh, Best Film. And then for Angie's Logs, I won like a couple of Best Web Series. And then Did you give Blind Side? No, right? Uh, I think Blind Side is a trailer for it. Um, hold up. It. Hold up one second. Let me just see something. I think I have one here. Hold on. While you're looking for that, I'm going to do the trailer for a Wonderful World. Hold on a second. Wait. So, look. So, yeah. So, look. So, I have one. Some award. Oh, <laughs> those <laughs> awards. <laughs> Listen, oh, you can't downgrade your accolades. So, yeah. So, I would. But, you know, after a while, it got to a point where it was nice to win awards, but it was. Uh, it, I wonder. I wonder. Yeah, I wonder what the criteria. Like, the, I think the, the 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 best part was like when you would get a robust crowd after they would see your film and they would ask you these kind of questions. You could kind of jazz to that. Um, yeah. Because you know, the, after you get like a, you know a dozen awards or whatever, different films, that's kind of like, yeah, okay. Yeah. And then you see stuff. The life like passing me by was huge, though. Right? It, 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 yeah, I got, I got some mileage out of it. I really thought that was the one that was going to sort of put me out there. I got really great reviews for it. Yeah. Um, I had a tremendous couple of screenings for it. And, uh, but you know, it's like a lot of things. It kind of, you know, came and went. I thought The Invaders also was going to do it for me. We really got a lot of traction with The Invaders. Um, I love The Invaders. But we couldn't quite get Disney to go for it. We couldn't get Nickelodeon to go for it. So they, they just, because, you know, it really wasn't, I think the problem with The Invaders is that it, it wasn't a kid's film. It had a kid in it, but it wasn't a kid's film, per se. It was about, oh, you know, it see. had a really kind of adult humor in it. Angie was supposed to be uh, <laughs> Colonel Kilgore in Apocalypse Now. She was like this person who would go into battle and 
you know, laser bolts would be jumping by and things would be exploding. Do you think if it, if it was animated, you could do it? Well, it's funny because, in because I mean, a company in Argentina offered me to do an animated version of it. Yeah. And they actually uh, did some artwork and sent it my way, but they couldn't raise the funding. And then some other people, you know, the, the thing about the invaders, it just attracts people because the look of it. And, uh, and really, mm -hmm. the invaders are just my way of doing like Back to the Future. I want to do a film where people wear colorful costumes and fright wigs and laser guns and explosions yeah, yeah, yeah. and stuff. And, and that was funny. And so I was watching Back to the Future one night. I said, I'd like to do something like that, something crazy like that, you know? And so I started kind of just writing ideas. And then, and then, and the story originally had like a bunch of characters and it had like all these different characters. And I pitched it to a bunch of friends and some money people. And they were like, yeah, you can't do this. This is too ambitious. So I took one character. One of the little girl, she's one of six characters. And I says, I'll tell her origin story, and maybe I can raise money, you know, attract people to the, the larger story. Uh, and that's what the, the invaders became. But go ahead, if you want to pull the, pull the clip, go ahead. Beth, do not open that door. We're being invaded by aliens. <laughs> You've been watching way too much TV. <laughs> So that was, was a fun project. You know, it's funny because the invaders, Angie's log, and if you Google it, you can find more um, clips. Yeah, we're, and on, we're on Amazon with that. We're in a bunch of different places. So. Yeah. yeah so, so if they want to buy the series, purchase the series is. I think for Amazon. Purchase. I think Amazon just re you, you just rent it or something. You can watch it. I mean, okay. uh, it's it's one of those things where, like I said, we're. we're I, it pops up in different languages. In Russian the other day, I saw it. <laughs> I said, wow, look at that. I love yeah. it. Yeah, it, 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 it was a fun thing. It took us two years to make that. I know. I know. Long. I remember. That was a, that was a arduous, <laughs> arduous time because we started with like three people in the crew. And we wound up by the end of the show, we had like a, a crew of like about 20. So when you told me about this one that I'm going to show next, I was really like, what? What are you doing? <laughs> Sexual healing, when you were telling me the story uh, yeah. of, of it, I was like, this is not going to go well. I was, but, I, was really, I was really embarrassed when I um, made that film. I, I, why? It, it you were embarrassed so when you were making it or you were embarrassed? Well, because I would, I, we would do these crazy scenes and like in it, like one day we had this shooting with these like, 15 or 20 extras in this apartment. And and it, this this girl, she's a high school girl, like sixteen years old or something, is in there. And so basically, you know, the whole idea is that the guy is able to. Well, uh, you want to show the clip first? Or you want? To... Yes. Okay. But I, I was when you were telling it to me, I was like, it's this a is it's a very bizarre story, and I it forgot. Uh, it, it was based. It, the idea came from a TV show from the sixties. I watched as a kid called The Immortal. Uh, Christopher George, where he played a race car driver who gets hurt and he goes to the hospital and it turns out he's never been hurt in his life. He's never aged, he never got sick. And somehow or another, don't ask me why, they wind up taking his blood because you're in the hospital. And then there's a rich old millionaire who's dying and he needs a blood transfusion. Again, I don't know what the logic of it was. They <laughs> give him some of the guy's blood and he gets younger. He doesn't die and he gets younger. And it turns out the guy's blood is like um, life saving, and he's like much older than he looks. He looks mm -hmm. like he's thirty five. He's like seventy or something like this guy. It turns out the guy's immortal, and so the the millionaire goes to the guy and says, "Listen, I will pay you to give me blood you know, to keep me alive." I guess I'm not going to be any guy. Can you pay? Can he leave? <laughs> and so he sends his guys to chase this guy to capture him and keep him a prisoner, so he can just siphon his blood off and stay young forever and so it was a stupid show in the, in, in the thing but i always liked the premise of the idea that this guy had this fluid <laughs> that would make people even younger or could heal people and i thought well wait what if we didn't do it with blood what if it was some other fluid <laughs> that did it 
And so All that's right. where the idea came from. Let me let me play the little clip, the trailer. I've got a favor to ask you, Dick, and I'll understand if you say no. Yeah, of course, anything you need. Well, wait, just don't be so quick. Just hear anything me out. Anything to help you make you feel better, right? Anything I can do. You I just want ask. you to have sex with me one last time before I die. Anything but that. Oh, you had banged me like that 20 years ago. We'd still be together. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so the, the idea is, is is Dick. His name is Dick Bates. Richard. Yeah, okay. And um, so uh, is this kind of loser guy. He's a ne'er-do-well. <laughs> and uh, he, he like has no friends, no girlfriend. He's, he's having sex with like dolls, you know. And... And so one day he gets a call from an old girlfriend from like 20 years earlier and she invites him over and she says she's dying and and before she dies she wants to have sex with him one more time and he says because i was the best as well everybody else i asked wouldn't do it so you're the last person i could see he he, he he does it because he feels bad and they have sex and so he, he figures he goes back to his apartment like three weeks later she knocks on his door and she's all cured and he's like wow you know you having sex with me cured me he said, no way. Yes, you, you cured me with this X. It's, it's ridiculous. He said, well, I have a way of testing it. So she brings another terminally ill patient over his house and has him have sex with the terminally ill patient. And that person gets better. <laughs> so then they start telling people about it. Before you know it, he wakes up one morning in his apartment and the apartment's full of people who've heard all about it and they all wanted to bang. But, but the original script had men, women, People had animals, animals that were sick, and they, they and they told you to take that off. <laughs> no, I couldn't get anybody to bring any sheep or anything. I wanted the oh. sheep. I wanted like like eh, my sheep dying. So Richard just wanted to do I it. Can't right? with you. Right, Richard just wanted to do it, and they said, "Listen," and they explained to him, "Listen, you have this gift. You know, you can do it. You can do all these people." You know, he said, "Mr. Dick," and one of them, one of them's like an immigrant, right? He said, "Mr. Dick," some of these people are very <laughs> sick, and some of them need your cure badly, right? So, you know, at the end, he sort of accepts his fate. He says, okay, what the hell, you know, I'll do it. And so he's, and he goes in the bedroom and all these people start following him in there. So I thought it was just kind of bizarre, but it was so hard to describe to people because when I would describe it to guys, they would laugh. But when I describe it to women, they'd be like, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah we oh. were, I was a little, and then oh. I was like, well, you know what? I guess I have to watch it because I do get your sense of humor. And I have, have, you, seen, have you seen it? I haven't seen the whole thing, but I've seen a couple of clips, okay. and it's kind of funny. You know, there are certain it, things. It, it, but it's I, yeah, it is. <laughs> Again, to, like if it was in an animated form, I, as I don't, to... I don't know. I'll tell you one thing. Um, I've sat through several screenings of sexually young people, mm -hmm. and I've never heard so many people roar so loud, loud with laughter. Okay. So, okay. Well, that's a good thing. Um, I did win one or two awards with it. I got nominated for a few others, but people laughed really, really hard. I mean, and and it's funny that I didn't do better with it because I think it's just the subject matter. I mean, you never see them do it. It always cuts away, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it cuts like like two and a half men. You know how they do sex yeah. in the two and a half men. The guy rolls up. Oh, that was great, Charlie. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so I realized I, I realized that the, the sex part wasn't something I wanted to depict. It was just the idea that he was going to have sex with these people. Right. And then it would cut to some other scene. He'd see him get putting his shirt back on, you know. And then it, so I think it was kind of tame. And, and it's funny because when we did the reading with the actors, I didn't want to be gratuitous. And so during the first table read, the actors were coming up with all these crazy ideas. Oh, let's have him do this. Let's have him do that. I'm like, guys, oh, man. oh no, it'd be funny. <laughs> and, and, the, and the women were coming up with really crazy shit. I mean, I think in the story, she's got these really big breasts, right? And the way that the character's written in the story is that she's just normal looking. But the girls went out and got push-up bras, and they stuck, you know, cloth underneath there. And you had these people who had A cups, and they like double D cups. I'm like, oh, Mr. Dick. He's like, okay, you know. So it really wasn't supposed to be about that. It was supposed to be he just feels bad. And um, then he had the joke where he, he, at one point, he goes to take a pee in the bathroom. And all these people follow him in the bathroom while he's peeing. And the girl pulls out one of those, you know, 
scientific cups, you know, the measuring cups, and mm-hmm. sticks underneath mm-hmm. the stream, and they're like looking at it, trying to figure out, you know, is any of this liquid? <laughs> and I'm like, what? And so they would come up with like these really crazy gags and stuff. So I'm like, okay. So uh, I'm always very careful about because you know I don't want to do anything that's going to uh, take anybody's humanity away from them. I know yeah. actresses and men can say, "Well, take off your clothes, baby," and we need this in the scene. I don't want to be one of those guys who, like you know, like the character in Fame, where he makes Coco take her top off. Um, I don't want to do that, and so I'm always very careful about. I mean, I like to do these kind of funny, sexy stories, but I'm very careful about that they're okay with it. I don't want them to feel like they were forced into it or they were right. pressured into doing it. Yeah. And so I'm like, I'm always trying to find ways of, of giving them out. And they're like, no, no, let's do this. Come on, let's try that. I'm like, okay. okay. And what about The Sweet Life? The Sweet Life was a script that, was a script that I found online from a guy named Danny Palumbo. And he, uh, I decided I wanted to, I decided that the true measure of a filmmaker was me directing other people's scripts. I could always write my own script, but could I direct other people's scripts? And how that's interesting because I saw it. I, like, I didn't see you in it. So that's interesting that you said that. Right. And it, and so, but it, what it is that it wasn't me, but it had my sensibilities. Correct. And so I, this is like something I could have written, but I never would have written it. Let me play, and, let me play it before you continue. Sorry. Sure. Stole money from me, and yeah, about that. I didn't realize I was gonna get caught. So, so when I read the script, I just let, thought it was the funniest thing I had read. And Danny Palumbo was this, he was a chef in Philadelphia, and he was doing stand up and he was trying to write scripts. And I said, and he actually sent me another script called Masculinity about two guys who uh, were friends, uh, based on a friendship he had with somebody. And one looked like a drug dealer, and the other one seemed effeminate. And so. Neither one were what they appeared to be. And I thought that was a funny script. So we shot that film and uh, I guess Danny liked it. He liked what we did with it. And he said, you know, I have another script. I'm like, listen, dude, I said, let me tell you something. You wrote a funny script, you're a funny guy, but the, 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 the chances of you writing two funny scripts in a row, and sure enough, Sweet Life was the second script and it was even funnier. And so I convinced my partners at the time because I had you know, producing partners uh, to let me make this. And so we, we put it together. And Maria Rusulo actually uh, came in. We were producing some of the time and she just did a great job of producing Sweet Life. I was I didn't know where to shoot it. I was going to shoot it in Brooklyn or the Bronx. I, I have no idea. Was this supposed to be based in Brooklyn? It wasn't. It wasn't. It was just generic okay. script. And so Maria convinced me to shoot it. Because it looked very, it. forget about it. You yeah, know, yeah, very... we, no, we shot in Staten Island. And, okay. Okay. And, that makes uh, sense. And so she and her sister-in-law and her friends got us all the locations. They got us Victor's bar and they got us the dumpster because the script describes this dumpster on the side of a church and there's a shootout, right? But that's how it opens up. But there's not a shootout. The kids are hiding behind this dumpster and these guys are shooting at them, you know? And I said, how am I going to do that? How am I going to do that? I ain't got a dumpster. And so she came on and we just, I was scouting locations in Brooklyn with the DP. I had a DP. A guy named Shane Wilson, uh, who was a still photographer who wanted to get into cinematography. And I thought it'd be a cool idea if 
a still photographer started shooting movies because they would have a really good eye for composition. I mm -hmm. said, well, why don't you shoot this film for me? And he said, I've never shot a movie before. So it's okay. I'll do that part. You just give me the, the framing part, the lighting. And he, he'd been experimenting with some shooting, but he never shot like a film film. And between Maria and Shane, Irving, they just came in and did, and my friend Mike Nero, who I met, mm -hmm. thing, they just did a wonderful job of, of putting the film together. So you're right. A lot of it isn't me, but it's my sensibilities in terms of the choices I made. But yes. I, I was attracted to it simply because it wasn't me. So let's talk about the bagel. Uh, yeah. Let me play it first, and then we, you can tell me a little bit more than you told me before. <laughs> so how did it go at the doctor's? I'm pretty good. She said there's nothing to worry about. But she did say that we have to abstain from having sex for six or seven... Six or seven days? That's no big deal. Weeks. I found this thing. A thing? Yeah, it's sort of a... It's a marital aid. We're all alone, no chaperone can get our number. The world's in slumber, let me see. Everything you always wanted to know about bagels were afraid to ask. I love that. <laughs> yeah, it was it was based on that book, Everything You Always Want to Know About Sex We're Afraid to Ask. And uh, it was a contest in New Zealand that they had to make a, a film in five minutes. And they gave you a prop to put it and they gave me a bagel. And I remember the film as a kid, uh, the Woody Allen film in the 70s, seeing it. And it was a scene in there where a guy falls in, where a guy is a, a therapist and a guy from Greece comes with a sheep. And he tells him that he's in love with the sheep and he's a shepherd. And, and you know they're having they're having an argument, and he wants him to talk to the sheep mm. to convince the sheep to not leave him. Not that he wants to stop having sex with the sheep, but they're having marrow problems. So the guy says, "Okay, you know what? Leave the sheep with me, and I'll talk to him, talk to her, and see what's what." And Gene Wilder plays the therapist, and uh, in it, he winds up talking to the sheep, falling in love with the sheep, and then stealing the sheep from the shepherd, and and having an affair with the sheep. And then the shepherd comes back and steals the sheep back, and the guy winds up becoming a, a drunk and destroyed. So I thought it be, might be funny if it was about a story about a guy who, who you know, temporarily can't have sex with his wife for six weeks. Wow. And, and his friend, when he's commiserating and talking to his friend, he says, oh, well, you know, my wife, I couldn't have sex with her. Well, and then I found some that work. And so they have sex with bagels. And he thinks the idea is strange, but, you know, he tries it. And then he gets hooked on it, you know, like the guy <laughs> And in the end of the movie, he's got the Mr. Potato Head. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Because that he wants, because he starts taking it out on dates. Because that means about having sex with the people. It's, they're going right. on dates and they're they're partying. And so he, it's not just merely physical. It can have this whole romantic relationship with his baby. Yeah, yeah. And I thought it was silly, but it um it was on Amazon and they kind of took it down. They got some complaints about it. Really? Yeah, people said that it was not what they thought it would be. <laughs> Of course. And so they said, so we're not going to do this, but you're not going to get any more revenue stream. And we're not going to promote it anymore. We're just going to let it play out. Like, okay. For a while, you I was, for you while really I was, have to do your own stuff. I mean, wait, for a while, I was getting a pretty nice check. I know. <laughs> so before we go into a wonderful world, um, what are the other films? What's the buzzkill? Buzzkill is something I'm working on. I just finished. It's about um, when I was in college my friend my first friend michael um we did a film called drug trip for a, a stage show he did and it was about these two guys getting stoned in the bathroom and you know back then they used to call weed different things they said, oh this weed sesame and, and my dad used to have this thing he said this weed is from mars it's martian weed because when you smoke it you feel like you're on mars and my friend michael thought that was the funniest thing ever and so we had to do a little film like Saturday Night Live. Remember, we used to see Saturday Night Live. So now here's a film by so and so. And so Michael had a show in NYU. And here's a film by Mark Cabroy. So I made this film with me and Michael playing these two stoner guys in the basement. They get high and they go to Mars, right? Because they get so high. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is they wind up getting eaten by a monster on Mars. It's a bizarre little comedy. And so when we were with Blindside, we were touring with Blindside in California, Maria and Mike Nero and myself. And we stopped in to see my other friend, Michael, and he had a copy of the film from college. And he showed it to Maria and us, and we all laughed at it. And Maria said, you should do a sequel. You should do a sequel to this film, where 20 years later, you know, you're coming out of the closet, you know, you get eaten up. <laughs> I said, I can't do that. But I like the idea of the film about two stoner guys going to a different dimension. 
So Buzzkill became a kind of a, a story about these two guys, these two guys, a Cheech and Chong kind of characters. Right. who wanted up smoking this kind of crazy grass. And they have this new TV, it's like a new 3D TV. And the guy falls into the TV and into this horror movie that he's watching. And he winds up switching places with one of the characters uh, in the horror movie. And she becomes him and he becomes her. They actually gender switch. Wow. And, and then she comes out of the TV and then winds up getting high with his friend, watching him play out her role in the movie. <laughs> So I thought it was crazy, and, and it's funny because you know when you do these things, you're like, "Well, how am I going to do the gender switch? How am I going to, where am I going to get the thing from? How am I going to do this?" Because you, know? you know when you write this crap, you just write it. You know, you don't have to think. Ah. And so I, I stayed away from it for a couple of years, and then I couldn't quite get the actors I wanted to play. I wanted the black guy to be like one of those white black guys, like you know Carlton on The Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Hey, well, and so. I was at was that other I, one from um that improv comedy show? Yes, it, David Allen Greer. No, not color. him. No, not him. <laughs> but go ahead, I'm sorry. So I was at this award show. I was winning an award for the invaders. And I was in the lobby and there was a photographer taking pictures. And there's a guy named Wes Green, I'll never forget. And Wesley was an extra. In sexual healing. Oh. And so he's, hey, Mark. I'm like, hey. Because, you know, you make a movie, you don't see everybody. You know, you. Right. I said, hey, what's going on? Hey. He opened his mouth. He had never spoken to me when we were shooting the other movie. Or we spoke very little. And he sounded like Carlton. Um, <laughs> and I said, holy crap, you're the guy. You're Cameron. He goes, well, you're the guy for the movie looking. And he's an actor. And he was just doing this you know, to make extra money. And once I had him, Everything else fell into place. So is Wayne had, Brady that I'm talking about? Yes, Wayne Brady. Yes. Wayne Brady, yeah. yeah. But I, but not like an Uncle Tom. He just doesn't say. No, no, no. I know. I know. He's in the deep. Yo, man, what's up, man? What's up? No, man? I know what you're talking about. So, um, yeah. So it, it came out, and I thought it came out really funny. It, 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 yeah. I don't know if I sent you a trailer for it. I, I don't know if I sent you a trailer. You didn't, but I, I doing my research um, again. It's a crazy film. Again, I found know, I mean, a lot of your stuff, and yeah. hopefully. Hopefully, yeah. you know, and I'm wondering, um, I know that some of your film is available on Google, you know, like just at least the trailers or whatever, but is there a place where these films are actually registered? Yeah, I'm actually going to, well, you know, after a couple of years, you, know, you put them out there in kind of public domain so people can see it, but I'm actually with Buzzkill still doing festivals run, so I think we're in a festival, I think. Okay. I think it's next month we're in, so while it's still playing, I try not to make it available. I send it out That's to fine. the actors. But yeah, but you can see if you, my, I have a fairly open Vimeo account. So everyone's just put Mark Cameron in Vimeo. A lot of stuff is in there. Uh, and you can just watch it. Yeah. You know, kind of crazy. I'm, I'm going to play The Wonderful World. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then we're going to wrap it up. It's going to be two hours. <laughs> oh my God, I know we were talking so long. I know. Something wrong? I lost an earring. You lost an earring in the kitchen. Is there a hole in the bottom of the door? Wonderful world. Oh yeah. I love this, and I haven't seen it, but yeah, I want to see it. It, <laughs> it. it was a story that I had done, and actually, I think I, I think I might have won an award or two for that. One. I don't even remember. Um, I was kind of unhappy at one point, and I wondered if I could go to another world where. I would be happy. Would I bring my unhappiness with me? And so I wrote this story about this couple who was very unhappy. Uh, they had been married for like 20 or 30 years. And they were just at that point where, like, you know, it wasn't that they didn't love each other. They just, you know, they just, they'd been together so long and they didn't, they grew apart. And so one day they find the doorway to another dimension. And when they crawl through the doorway, it's a replica of their world. And they find another couple. They find a copy of themselves there. But those people are happy. They're, they're exactly them. 
but they're happy. And they're trying to figure out why are these people so happy, but we're unhappy. And so the happy couple notices that they're unhappy and says, what's wrong, you know? And then they say, what's your world like? And it's exactly like your world, except you're just, we're, not, we're unhappy and you're happy. So the, un, the happy couple says, well, can we go to your side and, and see what your world's like? And they said, sure. So they go to their side. And when they do, um, the door seals back. And now each couple's stuck on the other side. The unhappy couple's stuck on their side. So the happy couple are looking around and the unhappy couple are on the happy couple side and they're walking around and they're looking at and they open the door and they find this dystopian world where everything that we've ever feared has come true. Global warming, the, everything, the goods and services are broken down. The world's like this horrible place. And then they realize the reason why this couple is close and happy is because that's how they survive in this environment. And the happy couple looks around and it's here and they're like oh my god what a wonderful world so now the happy couple's in a happy place and the other happy couple's in this dystopian place so it sort of reminded me of like when your mom says you keep crying i'll give you something to cry about <laughs> and that's really what it was and i thought it was a very clever script and it is uh, i had two great actors um chris cardona who, yeah um, no not chris uh, lapanta who um it, you know I used them blindsided. I, I love these actors working with them. They were great. Because, you know, when you work with actors, you want actors who are going to take the part seriously, who are going to do their homework, who are going to prepare and be ready, not just to memorize their lines and hit marks, but to, right. to bring something to it. You want intelligent actors who are going to question you and say, okay, this and that, and make suggestions. So that later you can take credit for that and say, that was my idea. Um, and that's what they were. And Eileen, I had worked on a project was called something about ryan there was a, a series we had done 10 episodes with it never saw the light of day because legal press so the, the project was totally shot and made and we never screened it for anybody 10 episodes of this thing mm. and she was a guest star in one of the episodes and she was such a great actress she came from the theater and you could tell she just she just hit it and i remember thinking to myself i, I remember taking her to the side during her scene saying i'm so sorry you're so much better than this material. You, you, you know, that you have to do this crap and I'm gonna find something for you. And I never did. We tried to do a couple of projects together and we could never get them together. And one day I was out on 8th Avenue and we were coming out of a rehearsal studio for sexual healing. Oh, maybe it was another movie. And I ran into Eileen and she said, hey, Mark, you know, I'm still acting, blah, blah. I'd love to do something with you. Keep me in mind for something. And I had been fooling around with the idea for a wonderful world. And I couldn't quite see what the people look like. And when she said that to me, they look like Eileen. And so I went home and I wrote that script a couple of days later. I sent it to her. And I had been wanting to work with Chris again since Blindsided. And so we put it together and we, we shot the film in about five days. It was really wonderful working with them. They were really great. So that's awesome. Do you have any questions for me? I do. So, um, how much do you get paid? No, a hundred dollars. I was going to say that you know it's interesting to see the research you did, and it's it's funny that you know it, you know people always say, well, you've done so much, but to me, it doesn't feel like I've done a lot. And I had a conversation with a friend of mine recently, and he said, you know, he's he's a guy who who makes films. As a matter of fact, you saw one of we went to one of his films, Michael Sargent, who did uh, the thing with Malik Yorba. And Stacey Dash, we saw the, the personals. We went to the screening of it, you and I. This goes back about 20 years. And so Michael is directing in the movie now. And he always says, you know, I'm always impressed by the volume of work you've done. I said, yeah, but you know what, Michael, you're getting paid to direct. I'm not getting paid, you know, you're, you know. And he said, yeah, but you know, it, it's good to get paid, but I'm just impressed by it. You're always making something. And I think that one of the things of not, because I have done stuff for money. I have directed for money. But one of the things about doing it yourself is you're not waiting for someone to come on and give you something. Exactly. Exactly. You're just doing it because you dig it. And not everything works. As a matter of fact, a lot of things don't work. But it doesn't matter because it's not ultimately about whether it works or not. It's just you did being it. busy and, and doing it you know, and enjoying the process along the way. So I was just curious for you, what was it like when you sort of realized I did have a large body of work? Because you were kind of surprised, right? I, I always envisioned you as a person who read a lot. 
So I was always like, where does he get his creativity from? He needs to be in the hood. He needs to come and visit me in the hood. He needs to get away from where he's at right now. He's in this other world. <laughs> so that's how I envisioned you. So when I looked into, like, really digged into the research for this interview, I was like, oh, my God, like, what was this wonderful world? Because I, <laughs> we, we all, you know, we got so caught up with work yeah. and raising our families and, yeah. you know, you get busy with working overtime and you get busy with check-in and we have our peak time from work. So I always, I knew you were busy and, but I didn't know how busy you were <laughs> getting busy mm -hmm. with doing your creative work. So I was, I was not shocked, but I was like, oh, I'm so glad mm -hmm. that while you were, you know, working all this extra shift and not being able to spend time with friends and have friends and socialize mm -hmm. that you were actually doing something. So that was one of the things that I was like, okay, I have to have him on the Salty Coffee podcast because that was, for me, that was like, this is what this podcast is about. Like, how do you balance work, family, you know, work, work, and still paying the bills and making money, but being very creative and, and still enjoying life, you know? Like, I don't know if you want to mention that you're into your next, new venture yes. of not having to do the traditional night time because i know working is always going to be something that you're always going to do well i think that balance is a funny word you know you 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 make time for what's important and people right. say they don't have time but you know I, I i find myself not i'm always amazed at you because you're always saying oh i saw this thing on netflix and Oh, I saw the show. The show. I'm like, when did you get time to watch your show? I barely have time. I watch TV like one hour a day, and I gotta know what <laughs> hour I'm gonna watch. You know. And I don't even I mean, watch. I don't think I watch that much TV, but I take time. I just, I just don't have the time. I'm always working on something. Like when I just before this this broadcast, I was writing a script. I was working, and I had this idea about this woman who goes to this guy, this you know, this younger woman goes to this older guy. Because now my my characters are old like me now. And she says, listen, I, I live downstairs. I want you, can you marry me? She goes, oh, I'm not a minister. She goes, no, 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 I need you to marry me. I said, I don't even know you. She said, well, look, I have a grandfather and I get a trust fund if I get married by a certain age. And I've been holding out for it and I, I, I have to get married. Other, I get cut off and I don't, I don't get the money. So, and he says, well, how much time do you have? Uh, three hours. <laughs> So she could convince this guy she doesn't know who's like 20 years older than her to marry her so she can get the trust fund. She said, oh, and there's one other thing I gotta tell you. We have to have a kid because if we have a kid, we get even more money. So she can't marry <laughs> real quick. We have a couple of kids and we get all this money and I'll cut you in for 10%. Well, why would I possibly, I don't even know you. Why would I, why would I possibly do that for 10%? It, it's not enough. She said, okay, all right. So hear me out. I can give you one good reason why you should do it. You had an ex-wife. She took you for all your money. You're living low, right? Imagine how she'll feel if you, she, you show up with somebody 20 years younger than you. So it cuts to them getting married, <laughs> right? And then like, she's like this younger hot chick. So she's like, okay, now we have to have sex, you know, because you know, we have to have the kid because we only have a year from the day of marriage to have the kid, right? He said, and I don't know if those pipes are working down there, right? So he's like, totally against it because he feels creepy. He said, I feel like creepy. And I feel like you're using me. She said, it is creepy and I am using you. But the reason why I'm with you is because you're old and I won't, you'll probably die before I will. And I'll okay. get the money. He said, that's really cold. She says, yeah, but you know, if I go with some other guy, they're gonna be younger, they're gonna try and control things. Plus, you know what? They all wanted too much. You wanna do it for 10%. <laughs> so, so the story is about this younger woman dragging this older guy around, getting him to do everything she wants, right? Give him his 10%. But he's totally reluctant because he feels like he feels this strange, creepy kind of thing. She says, it, it is bad. And she's not even lying. It's horrible. But look at this way. You get to bet me every day right. until, we have, until I get pregnant. And then occasionally you can still get some, right? Right. And, and so they negotiate. So the story, I, was, I thought it would be a funny idea, sort of like sexual healing about, because I think there's a, there's, I think there's a lot of, humor 
in human sexuality and in our mores and our whole thing. I think that is mine. Again, this is much about showing them going at it. And right. just her, right. just talking all this trash to him and manipulating it. But I was thinking about either doing it as a short film or as a web series where each week you'd see some new shit that she's in that she dragged him into because, you know, even though she says, I'm ultimately using you, I have no feelings for you. Right. But during the course of the story, these feelings kind of develop. And of course, he's been hurt. So he's reluctant to sort of hold on to his heart. So how do you do your screenwriting now? Do you voice type it in or you actually? No, 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 I'm still, I'm still typing in. I'm still. Come on, do the voicing. It's faster. Not really because. They do though. No, not really. I still and it has to, your accent in it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I still, I still need to hear it. And, and I like the, I like the, um, the, the, the haptic the tapping feel. noise. No, I like the feel of the keys and the right thing. Really? I like to see the words, yeah. And I like to see the words spell out in front of me. It's okay. And I back up. Let me change that word. Yeah, and change this. Okay. And, then, and now, the only thing now is when I type on a, a computer, now I have, before I used to, have to do research, now I can do research instantaneously. Like, I don't have to go to the library anymore. I can okay. hit Google, right? And go, oh, that's how you spell didactic. <laughs> Oh, wait, 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 hold on. Let me see what that means. I want to make sure I'm using the word right. Oh, yeah, okay. Just that. ask okay. Alexa. Uh, you know, no, nah, she's busy listening to my TV choices. Oh, okay. And, and she always, so she, I, she always I'm asks always... me the same question. Why do I always ask her to show me nasty, nasty Asian.com videos? Oh, God. But I always um, am thinking of, you know, like, not you haven't inspired me to do it, but I'm always like, with ideas you know but they never come up you know so i yeah when i was doing your research i was actually surprised at how much work you had done well i'll and tell you something you know uh when i did life specific by um i showed it to uh my supervisor wanda wonder work you know mm -hmm. and she watched it she said when did you have time to make a feature and you're working <laughs> I said on weekends. And she didn't but say you, it like that. We know how she, she said it, but but she said it with that tone. When did I know. Come, I think it was a, and then I shot on campus, you know, where we work. Yeah. So I'm in buildings all this. Like, mm -hmm. How did you get access to these buildings and stuff I'm like that? I just asked people. Because everybody said, no, no, public safety news. Oh, it's more no, Mark. You can keep go film. <laughs> I know. Yeah. And so I said, well, you know, I did it on weekends one. I did like um, on Sundays, uh, you know, 13 Sundays. And, uh, I did it. And she said, well, there's 24 oh. hours in a day. Come on. Well, you know what it is? It's that, and you, you only know, work I seven. I think what she was. I know what she meant. That, Why aren't you tired? And a lot of times you are. You're just on adrenaline like you. You're doing your show and you're working. And it's time to put your show again and promote it. The promotion is what freaks me out. All the little ads I see that you put out. I said, I wish I had that sense of self promotion. I, I mean, it's simple. It's automated now, and 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 I know that filmmakers like you and I and I meant to ask you that question. How do you feel about the new generation where it's so easy for them? Like I could create a video in like two <laughs> seconds, and I never touch the camera <laughs> i tell i tell people all the time man if i had these tools when i was a kid i would be like yeah well, maybe not who knows maybe not because no i think that the the the, the, the waters are muddy because there's so much out there yeah it's hard to be seen and i think that i think it's, it's a very big tell that the, the most successful people now are either on TikTok or ig doing seven second and 20 Correct. second videos. Correct. And these guys are millionaires just doing little films. And I don't know if I would have, I don't know if I had that mindset to do these little short nonsensical things mm -hmm. as opposed to doing more, what you might call more traditional narratives. Maybe I would have, you know. You still I mean, have time. I, would, I, I mean, I TikTok is full and they want people like you because you, you can do two minute daily stuff on just film you know what today i thought about this and blah 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 two two minutes and well that's what well that's what i'm that's what exactly what yeah. i'm you know, I'm, re I'm retired in this one so that's why i'm gonna get into tiktok more because i'll have more time on my hands i, yeah, just, have to, I just have to come up with uh a genre and others because i notice on tiktok they do certain kinds of videos so you can't like do these kind of videos and you have to do 
stay in your lane kind of thing. So I have to figure out what could I endlessly do sketches about, you know, and not be bored with. You know, I, I like that one kid who does the, the magic stuff. You know, he always does the thing where he pulls the computer out and, and he, all his stuff is the gimmicks are visual gimmicks. Yes. And um, I have to figure out well, what do I want to do that would be like that because I get bored quickly. And I don't want to just make the same film over and over and over again, you know. Like I would do like kitty movies, you know, where somebody's always got, you know, big boobs and they're always like uncomfortable. You're trying I, to, like, I was thinking more of a, on a professional level, just give two minutes of tips. And that's it. I, I didn't really do instruction. I like to do something that's fun and it's quirky. Like, okay. I like to do okay. like, like, like instance, like awkward black girl. Okay. You know, I, I could do those things forever, you know, like these little weird things. I think that the we, we can call you the green eye bandit. The green eye, the green eyed bastard. They probably would think. Oh, <laughs> no. uh, but I think it would be. I think it would be really interesting to do like um, basic. I have to really look and see. My yeah. friends do them, but I have to see. see I mean, the other things. Send, I don't think I'm that interesting. Send us a survey. I don't think I'm. I don't think I'm that interesting. That's the other problem. You are. You just have to get out of the box. I'm literally in a box right now. While you I'm are. So, you are. So, you know, but uh, I'll come up with something. I mean, my first couple of weeks will be acclimating to not working, which is going to be interesting. And then just finishing up some projects that I have in my desk. And you traveled a lot now. I so have. I travel a lot. I'm insight gonna, on traveling. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue traveling and stuff and then just doing things. You know, I even talked to you about a part like in in, the, uh, in Twisted Sisters. So I'll still do those kind of, you know. Uh, Are, am I still, is that the one with the, the screen that you sent me? The screen? Yes. Okay. So it's just a matter of getting it together. I, I have to change my protocols because COVID took. Yeah, I was reading it. it and I was like, do I really look Muslim? And well, I mean, you know, what, <laughs> that, that's, what, that's what makeup is for. No, no, no. I, I was just thinking, okay. Because I, I do recall the, the Dominican Latina person in one of the one of your films. I think I want to do really I like Super Chica. You know, I've been working on that, the, the Hispanic superhero. And I want to do more uh, Latina, because you notice I do a lot of films, women-based films. And I want to do stuff more with Latin characters. I'd love to do like something like in a beauty shop in Dominican, you know, Dominican hair salon, the kind of wild crap that goes on in there. And just mm -hmm. the trash that they talk, I think that would be hilarious. Um, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna experiment and see what stuff. I I'm sure it's got, I've got a lot of interesting things coming up down the road. I've got okay. Super Chica definitely, and I, I just finished my first three D cartoon. I'll, uh, I'm adding sound and music to it now. So again, it's very Mark like. Um, That's a I'm good working, thing. Uh, you have to see it. <laughs> <laughs> I sent it to somebody today, and they're like, "Seriously." <laughs> Listen, post COVID, everybody's gotten a little more emotional and sensitive, and sometimes we need that different thing. I we guess, really yeah. I guess I don't know. My my stuff is always going to be different. So it is. It is. That's a good thing. So, if you had to give the twenty year old or the thirteen year old Mark just a one piece of advice. What would you tell Mark that's 13 and 20 that you've learned through the years? Charge me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I think I would tell me to not stress so much about success. And and because back then I measured it in you had to make money because my parents never made money. So I wanted to make money. But to enjoy the process, I think what I've learned is that had I gotten what I really wanted, which was to you know, work in Hollywood and do movies, I might have been famous or I might have been just like a lot of directors who you know, they make stuff, but you don't know who they are. They, they make good livings. But I don't know if I would have enjoyed it a lot because filmmaking is like working in construction. It's long hours. It's punishing. And it's constantly where you have to constantly work at it. So. At some point, I think you probably don't like it. You know, you're up at four o'clock in the morning and it's cold. I mean, most of the stuff that I've made, I've kind of liked making. So I think I would have told me just to enjoy the journey more and don't worry so much about where you're going to go with it. 
Because okay. I stressed out a lot in those early days about you know, making money, making money, making money, and not. And I'm not saying I didn't enjoy making the films. I just, I think I didn't enjoy as much as I could have because I was so concerned about what was what was I going to do next. I just let it instead of letting it happen. That's I mean, great. It's, it's like your, it's like your epitaph, you know. If, what would you write on your tombstone? And for me, I think if I had to, if I wanted anybody to put something on my tombstone, I think I'd like to put. He tried, you know. So I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I was successful what I did, but I tried to do it. I don't know. I mean, that word is a person, you know, the perspective of success to some people is different. Well, you know, the only reason why is because you know I I, I need to get off this thing. I'll tell you a quick anecdote mm -hmm. that happened to me. So when I was married like 20 years ago, I had a brother-in-law, and I had these little cards, business cards printed up. And so one day I forgot what happened. He just, I gave, he just gave, asked me for some business cards. And I got to hear, passing out or whatever. Mark Everett, filmmaker, some crap like that. Sort of. <clears throat> so about a week later, he comes back to the house. And he goes, Hey, you got any more of those business cards? I gave him all. I said, Oh, yeah, sure. Here you go. I said, What did you do with this? Oh, man, I went to this party in this bar. And I was just telling everybody I was a filmmaker. And I gave out cards, man. People buying me drinks. I caught with these chicks, man. I did this. And I was doing really well with your business card. And everybody thinks I'm you. <laughs> I was like, what? They said, yeah. And I said to myself, he's having a better time being me than I am. And so he, whereas to me, to do that kind of thing, to, you know, to use who I was to mack on people, would seem what it would have cheapened it. But he had no problems doing it. And he was having a great time doing it. Right. And I think that's what I would have learned to enjoy the ride more and not be so like, oh, man, I'm going to be this guy. I'm going to be this filmmaker guy. I get uh, it. I get you it. want people to take you seriously, you know. So I don't know. take yourself so seriously. That's great. Well, thank you so much Thanks for joining. Um, I'm glad that you're in retiring mode retirement mode i'm getting there i can't wait to get there i'm, I'm getting there i can't I'm getting, wait I'm to get, get I'm getting there I'm getting there really i know close. but the closer it gets there you know you i mean you're you're a great person so thank you thank you and thank you for old. finally saying yes no i'm just kidding <laughs> no i i felt so bad you've been asking i knew eventually thing, no i was not begging and no, 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 you kept asking. I felt bad. And you know, I've got like two other people who have podcasts. Come on my show. I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna get there. I just want to retire first. Uh, more time. I never have I hear you. I hear you. I mean, this is still new. Um, but you never know. Someone from North Holland may contact you tomorrow and be like, Hey, I saw well, that. you know what is that's okay, but you know, I'm cool, but I'm at the point now where it doesn't really matter anymore because no, I'm doing I get it, I get it. Enjoying it. And, and, and I like just I said, wanted to do and I'm not know. saying that because I have money now, because remember when that's the other problem, you know, when you retire and you get this check, eh, I don't have to worry about making money. Yeah, I'm good, you know. I it's nice it. to make money, but I'm like, okay, eh, well, I'm good. Um, I really I really wanted you because I know that many people we work with are also in the industry. Mm -hmm. of act either acting mm -hmm. or writing or yeah. producing so you know hopefully they can find, realize who you are and know who you are a little bit many, better many people do believe it or not and it's funny i, I always get i always feel kind of embarrassed so i talk to mark he makes films and i've given people advice and stuff I'm like well i guess i have so I'm just yeah. whatever, whatever whatever i can offer All right. so we're gonna leave it at that is is there a website your website that you can I share? took it down. I'm having it retooled. I had okay. I had I had the minimally invasive production. I had iMark films up. But if they that, Google if you, your name, they'll find if you it. Google me, there'll be so much stuff on there. You know, yeah, that's you a know. weird last name anyway. Nobody but also knows. if you if you put, put Mark Cabra on Vimeo, you'll see my Vimeo account. You can click on it. See so I think sexual healing is on my Vimeo yeah. account. You can see mm -hmm. it. I think one of what a wonderful world is definitely on there as well. I think I posted okay. that. Buzzkill's probably password protecting a couple of the other ones, but Angie's log is certainly not a couple of pieces of Angie's logs are on there. There's a lot mm -hmm. of and just, and just stuff I'm working on that I worked on that you know I didn't finish it or I did this. Right. So you can sort of see uncompleted things that I, I was sort of fooling around with. 
and right here on YouTube, Twitch, and Facebook and Twitter, people won't see the music, but through Spotify and Anchor, we will add all of the music that Mark mentioned, including the Stevie Wonder song. <laughs> That was my but, favorite one yeah. of the time. So thank you, Mark, again. Thank you you have a good time. night. Go to sleep because I got to do a double tomorrow. Oh, my God. So you'll be glad to be over with those doubles. <laughs> thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, Wanda. Have Take a good care. Time. Bye. Bye. So that was Mark. And um, don't forget, the Bronx is still collecting... Um, Donations for the fire in 181st Street and Webster Avenue. So, and you can find me at www.saltycoffeepodcast.com. And that's about it. I love you guys. Have a good night.